Dear, dear colleagues, good morning. Do you hear me? Good. But still we could hear you. Very well. Welcome, Mr. Under Secretary General, as well as everybody else. We are about to start our, our area formula meeting. I'm looking at my watch. It's 11 o'clock exactly. So let me uh, allow me to start. Uh, excellences, dear colleagues, the permanent mission of the Russian Federation to the United Nations, the permanent mission of the Republic of Kazakhstan to the United Nations, and the special representative of the Secretary General, Ms. Virginia Gamba, convened today an area formula meeting of the Security Council on an issue of paramount importance, protection of children in armed conflict, with a focus on the repatriation of children from conflict zones and their reintegration into the society. In uh, various countries around the world, engulfed in hostilities, children, members of families, families of former fighters and, or terrorists, face brutal violence and find, find themselves in dire humanitarian situations. The COVID-19 pandemic further negatively impacts these children as it prevents their repatriation and reunification with family members. Let me underline that states have the duty under international law, including the Convention on the Rights of the Child, to repatriate their nationals and to take steps to prevent children of their nationals from becoming stateless. States should assume primary responsibility to protect these children and ensure their safe return home. I would like to remind that the best interest of children should always be a primary consideration. Rehabilitation and reintegration are crucial aspects of the international agenda today. Russian Federation, as well as other countries, make meaningful efforts in this regard. We believe such examples should serve as, insp as an inspiration for other states. We call on the international community and the UN agencies to cooperate closely to support repatriation and reintegration of children from conflict zones. This meeting provides an opportunity to discuss difficulties and challenges of the process of repatriation of children, possible ways of strengthening international cooperation in this field, as well as what, we can, what can be done by the United Nations Security Council in fostering progress to that end. And with this uh, short introductory note, I would like to give the floor now to uh, Miss Virginia Gamba, Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict. Miss Gamba, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Ambassador, Mr. President, Your Excellencies, and distinguished members of the Security Council. I am really delighted to be here with you today. And I would like to thank the permanent mission of the Russian Federation and the permanent mission of the Republic of Kazakhstan for hosting this meeting on such an important topic. As you are aware, the work of my office revolves around four pillars of action in support of ending and preventing violations against children in armed conflict. The four pillars are protection of children from being used and abused in, for, and by armed conflict, prevention of violations committed against children from occurring in the first place, raising awareness and strengthening partnerships for the protection of children and promoting lessons learned and best practices for enhanced prevention and protection of children against the sixth grade violations. The tools of action at our disposal are very simple. Continued monitoring, improved and enhanced engagement analysis, best practices, and advocacy. Enhancing the engagement with parties to conflict on both protection and prevention, and the strengthening of analysis, public outreach, and advocacy has yielded positive results for children. With these tools, we have doubled the number of children released and freed from conflict, and multiplied the number of signed commitments and plans with parties to conflict over the last three years. Despite progress in defending children from being used and abused by, in, and for armed conflict, much more needs to be done to sustain these gains and 
to ensure the protection of children and the prevention of violations against them. In particular, the need to stop the recruitment of child soldiers remains the top priority in the CAC agenda. The prevention of recruitment of children is a complex set of actions. It requires norms and rules, oversight, training, and age screening to be in place. Equally difficult is the task of ensuring that children already recruited, forcefully or not, are released from conflict and safely reintegrated to society. Ultimately, the most complex action of all remains the sustainable prevention of child recruitment, particularly if one considers that children are recruited into conflict by different push and pull factors, ranging from impotence to forceful abduction to poverty. Excellencies, the need to release children from armed conflict and facilitate their expedited and sustainable reintegration, avoiding their re-recruitment, remains paramount. This implies age screening methodologies at recruitment centers to stop underage recruitment, the need to strengthen standard operating procedures on handover and release of children, and effective sustainable reintegration programs that place the needs of the child first. The universe of children used and abused in, for, and by armed conflict is immense. It includes children caught in armed conflict, forcefully made to fight conflicts that they never wanted nor created, and or violently exploited and abused by those around them. These children are deprived not only of their childhood, but also of their future, as access to education and health has often also been denied to them. Perhaps there is no sadder group of victims than those children who have been cataloged as associated in one way or another to armed groups, including those groups listed as terrorists by the United Nations. These are the children who have been left adrift by conflict, like flot flotsam in the sea. In this regard, I want to emphasize the importance of identifying and ensuring that children held for actual or alleged association with armed groups, including UN listed terrorist groups, are treated primarily as victims, not as security threats and that detention be used as a measure of last resort and for the shortest possible period. This, of course, applies also to foreign children who have been held for a prolonged time in dramatic conditions in camps in Northeast Syria and in Iraq, where their mental health, safety, and overall development are at stake. They are exposed to further trauma and stigmatization and are at risk because of the proximity to members of designated terrorist groups. Some of these children traveled on their own from their country of residence to areas controlled by armed groups, while others were abducted by those groups and forced to cross borders during their association. Children also cross borders with their families or were born to foreign parents who had traveled to those areas. Children born in or having traveled to conflict zones must not be or remain stateless. Their rights to a nationality and an identity must be respected and fulfilled. The repatriation of foreign children to their country of origin should be facilitated and prioritized in line with the best interests of the child and not in violation of the principle of non refoulement these children must be provided with assistance in reintegration, education, access to health and to livelihoods. They must be given their childhood back in a safe environment where they can build a future away from violence. They deserve a chance at life like any other child. This is one reason why the discussion today is of such importance. Excellencies, I take this opportunity to reaffirm that all children must be freed from the impact of armed conflicts, and we need to continue to work towards this objective. 
we must ensure effective monitoring and reporting of violations against children in situations of armed conflict, including through the reinforcement of existing child protection capacities on the ground, facilitating information exchange to identify and mitigate trends in the use and abuse of children in for and by armed conflict and prevent grave violations against them. As the vulnerability of boys and girls living amidst hostilities continues and is further exacerbated by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, securing a peaceful resolution to conflict that has the protection of children at its center is imperative. Since 1999, this Security Council has highlighted in multiple occasions the importance to ensure that the protection welfare and rights of children are considered during peace negotiations and throughout the process of consolidating peace in the aftermath of conflict. In its resolution 2427 of 2018, the Security Council stressed the importance of integrating child protection provisions at the early stages of all peace processes, emphasizing on the best interests of the child the treatment of children separated from armed groups as victims, and a focus on family and community-based reintegration. States hold the primary responsibility for protecting children's rights, and there can be no security without the respect of human rights. Now, more than ever, it is important to identify good practices and develop concrete procedures for the repatriation of foreign children trapped in situations of armed conflict and prioritize their full reintegration through programs designed to address their needs. I commend the action of states who are already facilitating the return of their citizens. The United Nations, including my office, stands ready to support member states in addressing this complex challenge with the aim to ensure children are protected from any form of violence and abuse and their rights are fulfilled. In conclusion, a happy, healthy child is not a security threat, but a contributor to society, to development and to peace building. It is that child who will be the cornerstone of our common future. Let us not fail our children for in so doing, we are failing ourselves. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank Mrs. Gamba for her statement. And now I'd like, I would like to give the floor uh, to Mr. Vladimir Voronkov, Under Secretary General, Head of the Office uh, for Counterterrorism. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, Excellencies, distinguished participants, I would like to commend the permanent mission of the Russian Federation and the permanent mission of Kazakhstan for their initiative to convene an open area formula meeting on an urgent and critical issue. This issue is repatriation from conflict zones, foreign children with alleged family ties to terrorist groups. I'm grateful for the opportunity to address you alongside with the special representative of the Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict, Ms. Virginia Gamba, a dear colleague and fellow member of the Secretary General's Global Counterterrorism Coordination Compact. We are discussing today a protracted, seemingly intractable issue. But the premise that should guide us is simple. We need to get children out of harm's way and into a safe home where their community, their country can care for them. And children and camps in Northeastern Syria, particularly Alhol, are in harm's way, vulnerable to the predations of ISIL enforcers and at risk of radicalization within the camp and deprived of basic support that children need. Their fate should not be contingent on political will. Ensuring their well-being as an obligation enshrined in international law 
and the Convention on the Rights of Child of the Child. And beyond the law, it's both a security and the moral imperative. The horrific situation of uh, the children in alcohol is one of the most pressing issues in the world today. And our lack of response will be viewed as a failure by generations to come if we don't address it quickly, particularly in the light of worsening conditions caused by COVID-19 pandemic. Dear colleagues, the first efforts to repatriate children from alcohol date back to 2017. Four years later, 27,000 remain stranded, abandoned to their fate, left to the predations of ISIL. Excellencies, member states that have repatriated their citizens have demonstrated where there is will, there is a way. Children who have been rescued from danger and harm in the camps are now living safely and peacefully with family members. A number of countries, including the conveners of this meeting, have collectively repatriated nearly 1,000 children and their family members. These countries offer a variety of experiences from which we can learn. These experiences are being compiled and the United Nations, including my office, is supporting member states to learn from them. And what we see thus far is that fears of security risks have been unfounded. We see that a comprehensive approach based on human rights and responsive to gender and age, mobilizing the whole society is the best answer. Member States, the United Nations, especially UNICEF and the child protection NGOs have decades of practice supporting children who have experienced the worst forms of violence to successfully recover and reintegrate into their communities. Time and time again, history has shown that children are resilient. When provided holistic community-based reintegration support, they can recover from experiences of violence and contribute to society. And there is a strong and clear body of international law and standards to guide policies and programs to address the situation of these children. They must be treated primarily as victims. Children under 14 years old should not be detained or prosecuted. Every effort should be made to ensure children are not kept in institutions but allowed to reintegrate with their family members within their communities. The best interest of the child should be the overarching consideration to privilege repatriating families together, supporting family tracing, contact and reunification. Excellencies, my office as the lead entity for counterterrorism coordination in the United Nations system has prioritized the plight of these children in partnership with our humanitarian and human rights partners, recognizing that the response needed is primarily protection. Together with UNICEF, the United Nations Counterterrorist Center in my office has convened 13 other United Nations entities to develop a global framework for all of UN support to member states on individuals returned from Syria and Iraq, including children. The global framework ensures coordinated and human rights-based assistance working across the humanitarian protection and security accountability imperatives in response to uh, requests from national governments which have repatriated or are committed to repatriating their nationals from camps 
in northeastern Syria and Iraq, including our home. There are children from 60 countries in the camps who are the responsibility of their member states, not of the Syrian Arab Republic or the non-state authorities who are currently holding them. The Syrian people should not be made responsive, responsible for these children. Again, the Syrian people should not be made responsible for these children. I urge all member states to fulfill their responsibilities and to ensure the protection and swift voluntary repatriation of their children. The United Nations system stands ready to support you. I thank you for your attention. I thank uh, the Secretary General Voronkov uh, for his briefing. And now it gives me pleasure to give the floor to Ms. Anna Kuznetsova, Presidential Commissioner for Children's Rights of the Russian Federation. Ms. Kuznetsova, you have Уважаемые коллеги, рада приветствовать всех сегодня и рада видеть всех, с кем мы уже встречались и обсуждали эту тему. Это говорит о том, что мы продолжаем работу над очень важной задачей возвращения детей. Your colleagues, I am happy to see you all at this meeting today. I'm happy to see you during this meeting on our essential work on getting our children back to their homes. А также хочу со своей стороны поддержать призывы к возвращению детей, которые прозвучали от уважаемых спикеров, как уполномоченный при президенте по правам ребенка, как координатор работы по возвращению детей из Сирии и Ирака и как многодетная мама семерых детей. I would also like to support all the calls to get the children back to their homes, both in my capacities, official capacities, as the presidential coordinator of uh, work on getting our children back from Syria and Iraq, and as well as a mother of seven. Сегодня только в лагерях беженцев на территории Сирии, тюрьмах Ирака по различным оценкам, как уже отмечалось, находятся представители более чем 60 государств. Среди них тысячи детей. According to various estimates, today people from over 60 countries, including a few thousand children, are stranded in Syrian camps and Iraqi prisons. Вне всяких сомнений, детям не место там, где идут боевые столкновения, где гибнут люди, где дети оказываются незащищенными, где нарушены, по сути, все их права. Undoubtedly, children simply don't belong to places where there is ongoing fighting, where there are conflicts and clashes, where people are dying and where children are vulnerable and their rights are getting trampled on. И это не uh, простые слова. Все, что я сказала, мы видели своими глазами. Как нарушаются права детей на здравоохранение, на питание и самое базовое право на жизнь и безопасность. These are not just mere words. I have seen it all with my own eyes. I have seen children's rights for health care, food and life and safety violated. Уже сейчас, возвращая наших российских детей на территорию Российской Федерации, мы видим, в каком тяжелом состоянии находятся эти дети. Хронические заболевания, которые требуют продолжительного лечения. Дети uh, находятся в истощенном состоянии, в очень тревожном состоянии. Маленькие дети порой еще даже не говорят. And right now, when we get Russian children back to their motherland, we see the grave condition they are in. Sometimes they suffer from chronic and neglected diseases. Sometimes they are malnourished. Their condition requires prolonged treatment. And sometimes small children are even unable to talk. Естественно, нет никакого разговора о защите прав этих детей на образование и иные простые детские радости, которые свойственны этому возрасту. One cannot even begin to speak about more complicated rights like that for education or simple joys of childhood. Задача этих детей – выжить. Выжить и дожить до, возвращ... до того момента, когда представители государств 
приедут за своими детьми. These children are facing difficult tasks simply to survive and to see the moments when representatives of their home countries come for them. Таким образом, уважаемые коллеги, мы прекрасно знаем, что сегодня необходимы срочные, слаженные действия по возвращению детей из этого ужасного состояния. Сейчас программы по возвращению несовершеннолетних граждан реализуют многие государства. Казахстан, Албания, иные коллеги. И мы стараемся быть на связи. Undoubtedly, we need to act in concert to get these children back to their homes, and I'm aware that a number of countries, including Albania and Kazakhstan, endeavor to do so, and we are always open to contact. Вместе с вами мы радуемся за тех детей, у кого появился шанс на нормальное детство. Together with you, we are overjoyed whenever children get a new chance for a new life. В Российской Федерации такая работа ведется по поручению президента с 2017 года. The Russian Federation has been doing so since 2017 on the instructions of the president. За все это время мы совершили 12 спецрейсов на территорию Сирии и Ирака. Throughout this time, we have exercised 12 special flights to Syria and Iraq. И вернули на родину 274 ребенка. We have brought 274 children to their homes. И сейчас продолжаем эту работу, и рейсы не остановились, кроме Сирии и Ирака. Мы разыскиваем детей, которые вышли за территорию лагеря Аль-Холь а, под давлением тяжелых условий и находятся сейчас, например, в Турции. Не так давно... Мы uh, взяли пробу ДНК у 36 детей uh, на территории Турецкой Республики. Aside from evacuating children from Syria and Turkey, we also work in different countries, including Turkey, where there are some children who ran away to this country after leaving the camp named El Hul due to the difficult conditions. And right now we are taking genetic samples from 36 children in Turkey. В России работает целая программа, в которую включены многие ведомства Российской Федерации. There is an entire multi-agency program in place in Russia. Основными принципами этой программы являются преемственность, последовательность и глубокая проработка каждого этапа работы. Its key principles are acting in concert. Uh, cohesiveness and deep attention to each and every aspect of this work. Стремление следовать законодательству, как российскому, так и международному, а также с учетом всех особенностей законодательства территории государств, на которых мы работаем, мы uh, разработали преемственный, серьезный и глубокий профессиональный алгоритм, который позволяет работать и успешно уже uh, который год возвращать детей на родину. Throughout the many years that we have been working on this task, uh, we have always respected the laws of both Russia and the territory where these children are staying, as well as international legislation. And we have elaborated a serious algorithm that enables us to do so. Одним из условий успеха нашей работы и реализации нашего алгоритма является уважение или принцип уважения э, к территориям, к особенностям законодательства тех государств, на территории которых мы работаем. Мы начинаем свои программы после переговоров с руководством государств, на территории которых будет реализована программа по возвращению российских детей. И я благодарю, пользуясь случаем, сегодня представителей Иракской республики, представителей Сирийской республики. Мы встречались с руководством этих государств и обсуждали uh, нашу работу. Эта работа была поддержана и успешно продолжена и завершена в некоторых государствах, например, в Ираке. I believe that our success is partially due to our respect to the laws of the territories where our children are staying. Whenever we embark on this journey, we start with the negotiations with the leaders of these countries. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the leadership of Iraq and Syria, because we have had many talks on this issue, and thanks to their support, we have managed to carry out this task. 
Также мы продолжаем вести переговоры с руководством лагерей Альхоль, Рож, для того, чтобы можно было разыскивать и возвращать наших детей с этих территорий. Moreover, we continue to negotiate with the leadership of the camps, including Alhol, to get our children back home. Наша работа не останавливалась даже в пандемию. Нам удалось преодолеть и этот барьер. Оформлены документы почти на 100 детей для возвращения на территорию Российской Федерации на данный момент. И работа продолжается. Первые рейсы уже осуществлены, и новая группа детей вернулась на родину. We have never stopped working, even during the pandemic. We have managed to prepare packages of documents for over 100 children. And we have already carried out the first flights, and right now we are working to continue. Мы глубоко убеждены, что работа по возвращению и репатриации своих несовершеннолетних граждан, эвакуации детей из зон вооруженных конфликтов должно вести каждое государство, чьи дети попали в эту беду. We are deeply convinced that all states children from which are stranded in conflict zones have to carry out work on repatriating their underage citizens from conflict zones. И эта деятельность основана не только на принципах гуманизма, это еще и обязательство по выполнению норм международного законодательства, конечно, гуманитарная миссия по спасению невинных детских жизней, и что очень важно и актуально, и на чем я хотела бы сделать особый акцент, в свете сегодняшних событий и вызовов 21 века – это важная работа по профилактике террористических угроз. Naturally, the work on repatriating our children from conflict zones is based on far beyond simply humanitarian and human principles, because this is also about respecting our international responsibilities, as well as our humanitarian missions to save thousands of innocent lives. And moreover, what is particularly relevant and topical and important today, this work contributes to the prevention of terrorism, which is an essential threat today. Забирая детей сегодня из атмосферы, где они могут подвергаться влиянию незаконных формирований и страшной идеологии, мы противостоим этому явлению, разрываем этот порочный круг терроризма. When we separate children from the environment where they are poisoned by these ideas and are influenced by illegal factions, we contravene this important threat. Для этого очень важно не только своевременно забрать оттуда детей, разорвав вот эту преемственность в, страшной, в передаче страшной идеологии терроризма, но важно и работать с детьми, вернув их на территорию своих государств. In order to do so, It's not enough to simply break this vicious cycle by taking the children away from this environment. We also need to continue to work with them after they are back home. Поэтому наш алгоритм возвращения детей включает в себя комплексную работу, куда входит огромная работа по реабилитации несовершеннолетних, вернувшихся из зон боевых действий. Which is why our algorithm is based on a holistic approach, which includes Rehabilitation of underage people who have gone back from conflict zones. В первую очередь, я хочу сказать, что ни один ребенок, которого мы вернули с этих территорий, не попал в сиротское учреждение. Все дети находятся в семьях. I would like to point out that not a single child out of those who returned to Russia landed in a group home. All of these children are with families. Все дети находятся в семьях, и в каждом из них работает пять специалистов. Это педагог-психолог, врач, инспектор комиссии по делам несовершеннолетних, духовный наставник и другие коллеги, которые помогают ребенку в зависимости от необходимости адаптироваться в новой мирной жизни. Which is why we involve various specialists, including a psychologist, a doctor, a social worker and a spiritual advisor to help children adapt to this new peaceful environment. Здесь бесценную помощь оказывают коллеги, уполномоченные по правам ребенка в субъектах Российской Федерации. Они координируют работу, сигнализируют о проблемах и помогают их преодолеть. Which is why uh, thanks are due to my colleagues in Russian regions, presidential commissioners for children's rights. They coordinate tremendous work. Работа, безусловно, ведется и с самой семьей, с образовательным учреждением. И uh, 
есть замечательные примеры истории о каждом ребенке, который мы собираем, копим. И а, могу поделиться с вами. Дети, которые вернулись из лагерей, сейчас являются победителями различных олимпиад. Они э, выигрывают фестивали, конкурсы, э, проявляют свои таланты и в награду за это могут получить различные поездки по стране и иные э, награды, которые э, помогли этим детям как социализироваться, а мы рады, что эти дети нашли себя в этой мирной жизни. And I would like to tell you a few stories about children who got back to Russia and how we've helped them reintegrate. Uh, because when these children get back from these camps, their lives completely change. For example, they might win various intellectual con contests or various arts festivals and uh, talent contests. And they are rewarded by various trips and prizes. And we are happy to see them reintegrate to this peaceful life. Уважаемые коллеги, видя какой интерес и какое внимание сегодня уделяется на международном уровне, международным сообществам, теме возвращения детей, я верю, что не только обмен практиками, не только выявление наилучших практик работы государств станет предметом дискуссии и обсуждения. Я считаю, что следующим этапом работы может стать выработка инструментов, которые позволили бы эти алгоритмы сделать более эффективными. Безусловно, они подразумевают консолидацию, безусловно, они, скорее всего, подразумевают те договоренности, которые мы можем осуществить в повышении эффективности той работы, которая ведется сегодня каждым из государств. Dear colleagues, I would like to tell you that the position of the international community regarding uh, this subject and my personal views are such that Simply exchanging best practices is not enough. We need to make a new step and begin to create various instructions and uh, think about how we can make our algorithms more efficient, how we can include various positions and agreements in our work, how we can uh, do what is best for these children. Буквально в этот момент, в эти дни, мы разрабатываем и готовим следующие выезды в лагерь Альхоль для того, чтобы забрать наших детей. Безусловно, и мы сталкиваемся с различными трудностями. И я уверена, коллеги, наши общие усилия, наш опыт каждого государства приведет к решению одной задачи – спасение детей. И еще одной улыбкой ребенка после нашей с вами большой работы станет больше. Это значит, что цель достигнута. Я благодарю всех, кто участвует в этой деятельности. Со своей стороны мы открыты к диалогу, готовы подключаться к тем инициативам, которые будут провозглашены, и сами готовы участвовать в дискуссии на эту тему. Спасибо за внимание. Dear colleagues, right now we are preparing for our next trip to the Al Hol camp, and uh, of course we are facing various difficulties, but I'm sure that if we exchange our experience and pull our efforts together, we will manage to carry out our shared task. We will manage to make one more child smile happily when their life is changed for the better, because this is what we are working for after all. And to conclude, I would like to thank everyone who is somehow implicated in these essential tasks. On our part, I would like to say that we are always open for dialogue. We are ready to join any initiatives that might be helpful to, to that end. Thank you for your attention. I thank, thank Ms. Kuznetsova for her informative uh, and experience-based briefing. And I would like uh, to personally thank her for the efforts that she has invested into this uh, noble, uh, in no noble cause. Uh, and now I would like to give the floor uh, to my colleague, Ambas Ambassador uh, Magjan Ilyasev, permanent representative of uh, Kazakhstan to the United Nations and the co-organizer of this, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, meeting. Uh, he is also co-chair of the Global Coalition for the Reintegration of Child Soldiers. Uh, I understand that uh, in the process of his briefing, uh, he will uh, demonstrate a video presentation of Kazakhstan experience 
uh, in the repatriation and reintegration of children uh, from uh, conflict zones. Uh, Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start by expressing uh, sincere gratitude to the Office of Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children in Armed Conflict, Under Secretary General for Counterterrorism, Mr. Vladimir Voronkov, and our Russian colleagues for the opportunity to co-organize this event and also to address you today on a very significant undertaking of my government to stop the further, further spread of terrorism. And let me start by a briefing statement followed by a video where you will actually witness how the repatriation of Kazakh men, women and children took place on the ground. So in 2019, several countries select United Nations agencies and international organizations, including the International Committee of the Red Cross assisted my government to execute two special operations called Jusan and Rusafa to repatriate Kazakh citizens from the conflict zones in Syria and Iraq respectively. The project initiated by then President of Kazakhstan, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, was successful, and we brought more than 595 citizens uh, to our homeland, including 33 men, 156 women, and 406 children, of whom 31 are orphans. The implementa implementation of these measures is a vivid example of the practical implementation of the concept of the state that can hear its citizens which is uh, undertaken by the current president of Kazakhstan, Kassim Jamar Takayev. Uh, realizing that many who left for Syria actually went there by fraudulent means, and despite the risk and seriousness of the reintegration of the citizens into a peaceful society, our state leaders made a responsible decision and did not leave its citizens behind. The thesis confirming the correctness of this judgment may be the fact that the 33 men who choose to return to their homeland knew ahead that they would face criminal persecution in Kazakhstan, but still preferred that rather than remain in the war zone. Today, we are challenged with citizens of several countries wanting to return home following the breakup of the Caliphate of Raqqa and the physical dissolution of ISIS. Kazakhstan has pioneered to bring home its citizens in order to give them a new life. It can be imagined a situation like this is a complex and delicate undertaking over many stages. As regard the practical experience gained by our country, uh, I can tell that the process of rehabilitation and integration in Kazakhstan includes three stages. The first is a stage of social adaptation in a rehabilitation camp after arriving in Kazakhstan. The second stage is rehabilitation and primary socialization, which took place in different regions on the basis of special public foundation facilities and regional centers specially established by the government for that. At this stage, documentation of women and children, psychological diagnostics and correction, medical social assistance, retraining courses for women and theological correction were carried out. Much attention was paid to the social, psychological and social pedagogical rehabilitation of children, their preparation for school. The third stage, rehabilitation of further socialization and gradual integration to society continues to the present. To ensure the effectiveness of the rehabilitation process, several highly qualified social workers, psychologists, and theologists were part of the team to work with the traumatized returnees. The recovery and rehabilitation of children, especially, is carried out by teachers and counselors in accordance with a plan of action based on the recommendation of special expertise team set up by psychologists, medical and pedagogical staff on each individual case of a child. Uh, dear colleagues, equally important aspects of our undertaking were the processes of prosecution, rehabilitation and reintegration and the extensive experience we gained, which I would like to share with you uh, briefly in the following statement. In particular, through rehabilitation and reintegration, we are preventing further radicalization of the returnees as well as our population in our home countries. All women and children are immersed now in creative and therapeutic activities and cultural events aimed at their re-socialization. This is achieved through knowledge of national traditions and customs, explanation and discussion of the Quran, dancing proverbs and saying, as well as family-oriented sporting events and visiting theaters for children and their parents. 
While much progress was achieved, unfortunately, the spread of COVID-19 with its accompanying quarantine measures have significantly affected all spheres of national life, including our rehabilitation measures. However, every attempt is made to ensure that quality and pace of services are not impacted. Rehabilitation services take place through direct face-to-face -face communication with specialists, whereas lectures and meetings with theologists and psychologists are now offered online. Around 80-85% of those who fled Kazakhstan now very much regret their decision and admit it to be a mistake. The returnees confessed to the uh, atrocities they committed and acknowledged with embarrassment that they were blindly believing and trusting ISIL, ISIS and have never anticipated the fate that it would befall them when they would arrive actually into the war zone. However, upon encountering the reality, they now reject ISIS and its motives. This working with guilt and shame is very much a part of the rehabilitation process. So it's very important to uh, let these people speak, children speak, and never blame them uh, uh, of their mistakes in the past. The danger of a failed effort of reintegration of any of these fronts risks their radicalization and transition to other forms of criminal violent behavior. This also exposes new segments of the population to radical ideologies. These and other factors dictate the need to further improve the national system of countering terrorism and religious extremism. As regards the matter of further reintegration and repatriation of persons and especially children who have returned from combat zones, there are many difficulties with which in particular Kazakh public authorities have faced. For example, how can a child prove the death of his parents in order to receive state benefits after he returns? How we change the place of birth from Syria to Kazakhstan in his new documents? How children get used to ordinary peaceful life without bombing weapons and people dying before their eyes? How they choose the right path in life despite the psychological trauma? This is not a complete list of tasks to be solved by the governments and the returnees from Syria. The children that are returned have witnessed the crime and, and they are victims of uh, their parents' actions. They were also in the combat zone. They saw everything that happened there, the bombing, the mutilated bodies, the death. This is a psychological trauma, the consequences of which are delayed in the child's mind. We have to work with this and not wait for the so-called post-traumatic syndrome to manifest itself. This is clearly monitored by psychologists and social workers of our centers who work with the children in adaptation centers. To conclude, I would like to thank the UN, UNOCT for organizing this most relevant dialogue and reiterate Kazakhstan's commitment to contribute to our collective endeavors to achieve a safer world. In this context, I assure that our country continues to work on such a sensitive agenda, the results of which we are ready to share with all the partners and participants of today's event. And just to update you, as we speak now, Kazakhstan carries out just another repatriation of men, women, and children back. And in a few days, we hope they will return to their homeland. Now to your attention, I would like to present a short video about the original Operation Dusan, the first one that we carried out that clearly demonstrates the sensitive matter of the issue that we are discussing today. Thank you for your attention.
bir kez sakat çıkmasın. Bir şey hasta bekliyorum. This is indeed a, a, a moving video reel, and I thank I thank uh, uh, Ambassador Ilyasov uh, for sharing it with us, uh, which give us uh, not just an abstract uh, idea of what's happening, but uh, real real faces of those uh, people uh, who, uh, and in, in particular children who are who are being repatriated. I thank you, Ambassador Ilyasov, uh, for your for your briefing and especially for the video reel that you demonstrate. Uh, you now, much. before I before I give the floor to those uh, uh, to those members uh, uh, that wanted to take the floor, I would like to tell you that uh, that this uh, meeting uh, meeting drew uh, uh, attention of uh, of uh, many member states and uh, they all wanted to take the floor. So I. I wanted to advise you that uh, that we we might extend our meeting beyond one o'clock. So please stay uh, stay connected uh, beyond uh, beyond the uh, time announced uh, initially. Uh, also, before I give the floor, I would like uh, to, to to tell you that I, have, I will have to step to step out uh, for I have another meeting uh, shortly, and I will pass the button to my deputy Gennady Kuzmin, who will continue uh, continue the dialogue. Uh, now I would like to give the floor first uh, to Ambassador Mona Yul, uh, who coincidentally, uh, but not surprisingly, is uh, uh, a chair of the Security Council Working Group on uh, Conflict and Armed Children. Mona, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Vasilis. Uh, ex excellencies, colleagues. Norway would first of all like to thank the organizer for this event, for shedding light of a complex and important issue. The protection of civilians, including the protection of children, is a priority for Norway, and we aim to make it a cross-cutting issue on the Council's agenda. We are honored to share the Working Group on Children in Arms Conflict. Children caught in conflict zones are extremely vulnerable and at heightened risk of violence, including sexual and gender-based violence, early and forced marriage, as well as recruitment for use in armed conflict. We would like to stress that children who are recruited and used in armed conflicts are recognized by international law primarily as victims requiring rehabilitation and social reintegration. Indeed, children are often doubly victimized, first by the armed forces or groups attack attacking their homes and schools, recruiting or abducting them, and then by their government treating them as criminals and security threats. Children are often detained subjected to, tor to torture and held in horrific conditions. We recall that detention should be used only for the shortest period 
and as a measure of last resort. Alternatively, alternatively should be act, alternatives should be actively sought. Holistic community-based reintegration programs are key. Unfortunately, there is a significant gap in resources and a lack of interagency cooperation. The Global Coalition for Reintegration of Child Soldiers play a significant role in redemining this situation. We would like to also highlight the right to education for girls in particular. Safe access to education in, in both protective and preventive. Education alleviates the psychological impact of armed conflict, anchors children in their communities and provides hope for the future. This is why Norway gives high priority to education in emergencies, including protection of education against attack during armed conflict. We encourage all states to endorse and implement the Safe School Declaration. The Norwegian government is also concerned by the situation of children living in conflict affected areas. We are particularly worried about the children living in camps in northeast Syria. This is, however, an area full of dilemmas. There are no simple solutions. Each state faces a specific set of political constraints and legal requirements. On two occasions, we have brought Norwegian children home on a humanitarian basis. Norwegian authorities cannot repatriate children without consent from their parents or guardians. The very difficult humanitarian situation these children face makes it important to find solutions. We therefore work closely with key partners, including the Office of SRC Gamba, the ICRC and UNICEF. To conclude, there are no alternatives to international cooperation in addressing such complex challenges. We must work together to meet them and find solutions that are in the best interest of children while protecting their rights. Thank you. I thank Ambassador Mona Jul for her statement and for contribution of Norway to the work of the Working Group on Children Armed Conflict. And uh, I'd like to give the floor to the Deputy Permanent Representative of Vietnam, Ms. Tran Nguyen. Please. Mr. Chairman, uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Russia and Kazakhstan for convening this important meeting. I also thank the briefer for their informative presentations. And Ambassador Liz, uh, Liza Sof, um, thank you for your moving video. It reminds me on our most recent evacuations of uh, 10,000 Vietnamese, um, including children from Libya in 2011. So if conflict has been, been there, we are facing this issue all over the world. And um, resolving conflict has been a difficult task. Uh, resolving post-conflict issues, including child reintegrations, have been no less challenging. Therefore, we welcome today's discussions on these very paramount important issues, as Ambassador uh, Vasily said at the beginning. Um, Mr. Chairman, as mentioned in the Secretary General report, more than 10,000 of children were separated from non-state actors and armed forces. We have learned from USG Voronkov and other briefer that there are many, there are many, many of them are stranded in camps and detention centers with poor basic services. So besides, we, it was pointed out that there have been number of challenges hindering the successful and sustainable reintegration of the, these children, especially in the context of the COVID-19 pandemics. In this connection, Vietnam wished to highlight the following point. First, the prevention of conflicts and war should be conducted at the root by teaching our children at an early age to cherry peace and reject hatred. This early education will protect them from the harm of, of extremist and terrorist ideologies. It will also be the path for children to overcome original causes of conflict and war such as poverty and inequality. Second, we agree with uh, Mr. Chairman and SRSG Kamba that uh, the primary responsibility of providing security to and ensuring the protection of children 
lie with the governments of country concerns. We should take all necessary measures to prevent children from being recruited into armed forces or armed groups, as well as to protect them with reintegration policy and support. Third, children reintegration programs must be pledged at the heart of peace building and conflict prevention effort with long-term funding mechanisms. These programs should focus on, among others, providing psychosocial support and creating favorable reintegration environment for children. Once they have been equipped with skills to adapt with civilian life, children in armed conflicts can rebuild their life and become active contributors and promoters of peace in the future. Last but not least, we call on the international community to provide necessary financial resources for the separations and in reintegrations of children in post-conflict with a view to preventing re recruitment back into armed forces or armed groups. We also support the coordination role of UN agencies as well as the contributions of regional organizations in supporting country in post-conflict in the effort to eradicate poverty and promote universal education and sustainable development. Mr. Chairman, uh, bearing in mind that our children are our future, the government of Vietnam has played child-related strategies high in its national development agenda. We have therefore developed a variety of policy and legal documents, including the laws on the protection, care, and education of children the government, has been implement, the government has been implementing a national action plan for children with aim at building a safe and better environment, enhancing, enhancing quality of life and ensuring equal development for all children while closing the gap in living conditions among children in different regions. Before I conclude, I would like to emphasize that children should not be victims of conflict as many of but live in the embrace of love and happiness. Vietnam reaffirmed to undertake its part in common effort to protect and safeguard the futures of our children. I thank you. Roger, do you hear me? I, I can hear you now. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you so much. And thank, thank you to SRSG Gamba as well, um, and Under Secretary General Varonkov for your mar remarks today. It's, this is such an important issue, and we're really glad to be focusing on it today. Ambassador Ilyasov, thank you in particular for sharing your country's experience with us during your briefing. We applaud the efforts made by Kazakhstan to repatriate, rehabilitate, and reintegrate more than 600 foreign terrorist fighters and their associated family members from Syria and Iraq. We especially commend your focus on meeting the needs of returned children, including psychosocial recovery and efforts to prevent their stigmatization. The current situation that we face with more than 8,000 children of foreign terrorist fighters residing in camps in Syria and Iraq is not tenable. The international community can and we must do more. We cannot continue to let these children languish in overcrowded environments where they suffer from inadequate shelter, food, sanitation, educational opportunities, and health care. We acknowledge that this is a complex humanitarian and security issue, made even more urgent by the COVID-19 pandemic. We also understand that repatriation efforts must be handled with sensitivity and with each child's best interests is the paramount consideration. To address these challenges, states must first take responsibility for their citizens who engage in and support terrorism, including by repatriating, prosecuting, rehabilitating, and reintegrating their nationals who have traveled to conflict zones as is appropriate. States must also repatriate their most vulnerable citizens, children from these conflict zones. The United States, for our part, has repatriated 28 Americans, including 16 children from Syria and Iraq. Repatriation is not only the best security solution to prevent these fighters from returning to the battlefield, it's also the right thing to do morally to prevent an already dire humanitarian condition from deteriorating further. I'd like to take a quick moment just to stress a few key principles that must shape any efforts to repatriate children from conflict zones. First, 
we remind states that we must treat children formerly associated with ISIS primarily as victims. Second, it is of the utmost importance that any effort to repatriate foreign terrorist fighters and their family members are undertaken in compliance with states' obligations under international law, including international humanitarian law as applicable, and that states respect the principle of non refoulement Third, every child has the right to acquire a nationality and states should seek to prevent their nationals and the children of their nationals from being deemed as stateless. Children moved to or born in conflict zones should be provided immediate adjudication of their citizenship status and provided all of the appropriate civil documentation necessary for their travel and access to healthcare, education, other basic services. Without this needed documentation, as we all know, children can become invisible to responders and be excluded from receiving family tracing and reunification services, child protection assistance, or the ability to participate in civil registration and vital statistics systems. Along these lines, Mr. Chair, the Biden-Harris administration believes that children should not be separated from their parents or their caregivers whenever possible. If family preservation or reunification cannot support the safety and well-being of a child, other family care options that are in the best interest of the child should be made available. And finally, we must recognize that children are not a monolithic group and that our rehabilitation and reintegration programs must account for different needs and capacities based on gender, age, and other factors. As today's briefers have mentioned, the phenomenon of foreign terrorist fighters has not ended with the territorial defeat of ISIS in Syria and Iraq. We see foreign terrorist fighters traveling with their families to join ISIS affiliates around the world, including in the Sahel and in the Horn of Africa. But there is hope, as demonstrated by the decisions of Kazakhstan, North Macedonia, the Maldives, Kosovo, Italy, Bosnia, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, France, Finland, Germany, Ukraine, and others who have repatriated their citizens. Where there is political will, we can overcome even the most difficult challenges together. To conclude, Mr. Chair, the United States will continue to invest in preventative and responsive programming to protect children who have not yet been repatriated from conflict zones, from violence and abuse. The United States sees the work of SRSG Gamba's office, the UN monitoring and reporting mechanism on children in armed conflict, and UNICEF as critical in this regard. And we welcome the SRSG's ongoing engagement in Syria. As UNICEF's largest donor, the United States calls on other states to join our partnership with UNICEF and other multilateral organizations by increasing your contributions so we can better leverage their experience and capabilities in responding to the needs of children in conflict. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, United States. And it's my pleasure to give the floor the permanent representative of Kenya, Ambassador Martin Kimani. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And I want to thank uh, the permanent missions of the uh, Russian Federation the, and the Republic of Kazakhstan on organizing and the Office of the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict for organizing this meeting on repatriation of children from conflict zones. Uh, right at the start, I am hoping that um, the, the practical ways that uh, the concept note shows in which we can include key child protection elements uh, related to the repatriation, rehabilitation and reintegration of children will be part of negotiations and can be value, a value add from the Security Council among other UN forums. I wanted to say that even as we note the issue of repatriation, that it is extremely important to build up the capabilities of countries to actually handle uh, returnees, whether they're adults or their children or they're within families. And in that regard, Kenya would like to share just a, very briefly some of the lessons we've learned. One is that we have a terrorist, uh, Al-Qaeda affiliated terrorist group um, that is operates out of Somalia, Al-Shabaab, and therefore a lot of the recruits who are Kenyans are able to get across a relatively porous border and to be able to come back not directly into the, the institutions as they should be, but sometimes they come and embed themselves within the population. And we have to find a way to have outreach that reaches them 
that engages them and gives them confidence to engage with the government so that they can be put into a disengagement and reintegration process. And our view of that is one, we want uh, a clear way of using intelligence to differentiate between adult returnees who are actually a potential threat to our security and others who are of a less threatening nature and who can go through this um, um, disengagement and reintegration process rather than um, a criminal justice uh, process. So we take the time and have invested because we believe, one, that Kenyans deserve a second chance who want to come back home. And certainly the children of uh, individuals who've been involved in terrorism themselves deserve a chance to be come back to normal life. Otherwise, there is the risk that they too will be radicalized and potentially recruited into these same terrorist groups. And this is especially as all of you will have observed that these groups have a specific focus on trying to recruit children into their ranks. And that is not just terrorist groups. We've seen insurgent groups and militant groups the world over finding children to be valuable recruits because you're able to um, deploy them, I think, more effectively through, uh, through as they grow into adulthood. We also believe that uh, the returnees can be a living embodiment between the gap, uh, the, a living embodiment of the gap between the terrorist group's claims and the reality that people um, experience. And when they come back after disengagement and reintegration back into their community, they are able to be living witnesses to those around them that the claims of the terrorist group are false. And for that reason, we think that they bring special credibility in how they were brought into the process of being radicalized, how they were raised perhaps as children within the terrorists, and their voices can be a powerful asset in countering radicalization and recruitment. Now, it's not enough, I think, for many countries to, to, to want to do something. There are specific capabilities that are required. And I was happy to see uh, USG uh, Voronkov here, because I think the UNOCT can play a special role in advancing the kind of skills and capabilities that countries need in the disengagement and reintegration uh, flow. Um, and I hope that that's certainly something that you pick up. And I hope that UNOCT's initiative out of Kenya in terms of a regional office will be able to handle some of this work. In one minute, how does Kenya do it? We have the stages broken up into identification, uh, risk assessment and vetting, disengagement, which is done in an individualized way, and customization of a program of disengagement and reintegration. And then um, you move forward into probation, aftercare, surveillance, and so forth. And in terms of the identification, we are open to working with civil society, religious groups, community groups that often are able to tell us uh, when they get enough confidence in the process that they have identified a returnee who is scared but wants to come out and um, go through a process to become, uh, to get back to normal life. We then take that information at the very local level and we bring together multi-agency teams that assess the risk and vet this person from an intelligence point of view. And the, by, the choice then becomes if the assessment is that this person is uh, a serious threat to national security, then the intelligence and criminal justice system takes precedence over the disengagement system. Once we get into the disengagement system, we have taken the Danish uh, approach, but then uh, fixed it and contextualized it for specific Kenyan realities. We're able to, we have disengagement officers throughout every part of our country, and we're able to take through, uh, we've taken at least a thousand um, returnees through this process. Now, the risk assessment and customization that, that is built on the disengagement process uses psychologists, clinical psychologists, and trained security officers to do that. And the process then moves on into the rehabilitation, 
where the probation department, the aftercare department, and the security services work together with psychologists and social workers. We then move that into probation and aftercare, and throughout the process, we have a lot of surveillance ongoing. There's an into law enforcement. We still try and engage in disengagement, but under far more secure circumstances. Throughout this chain of action, skills are needed, legal frameworks are needed, and frameworks of coordination are needed. And many countries um, will require these kinds of capabilities because our assessment is that the terrorist threat, uh, as much as we combat it around the world, is resilient and is likely to stay with us for a much longer time. We welcome all delegations here and all those who are engaged in this meeting to engage with the Kenyan mission and with the Kenyan government to share our experiences and to work together to build and scale these capabilities throughout our region and globally. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and for bringing up this very important agenda uh, to our attention. Have a good weekend. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And now I'm, I'm going to give the floor to the Deputy Permanent Representative of the United Kingdom. Jonathan, the floor is yours. Mr. Chair, De Gennady, thank you very much uh, for giving me the floor. Uh, let me also thank um, SRSG Gamba, uh, USG Voronkov for the other briefers, and of course the governments of Russia and Kazakhstan for organizing uh, this debate today and for the opportunity to discuss uh, these critical issues. Uh, so let me start by saying that there is no doubt that conflict continues to have a devastating impact on children globally. The Secretary General's latest annual report verified over 25,000 grave violations against children in 2019 alone. And this stark number has only continued to rise with COVID-19 exacerbating inequalities among the most vulnerable in society. And I think discussions such as this one today are vital in understanding how we, the international community, can collectively do more to support children affected by conflict. And as discussed in the concept note, the situation in Syria is of particular concern. Syrian regime, supported by its Russian ally, have targeted schools and their military operations, restricted humanitarian access, and overseen Syria's deteriorating socioeconomic situation. Children have been the victims of human rights abuses and violence, including the regime's use of chemical weapons. Further, with mass school closures and increasing vulnerability to recruitment, the landscape for children affected by conflict is bleak the need for a comprehensive international response is absolute. Now, the UK systematically addresses these action, these issues through coordinated diplomatic and humanitarian action. The UK has given over $4 billion in response to the Syria crisis. We pursue accountability for those responsible for atrocities in Syria, and we support a UN-negotiated political settlement as the only way to end the Syria conflict. The British Foreign Secretary has made it clear that where feasible, the UK will work with relevant partners to facilitate the return of British unaccompanied or orphaned children in internally displaced persons camps in Syria, who, because of their age, are innocent victims of the conflict. This is determined on a case-by-case -case basis and subject to national security concerns. We are also working with partners within the frame of international law and in accordance with the four key humanitarian principles to deliver assistance to those in acute need across Syria, irrespective of nationality, through the provision of life-saving aid, such as healthcare, food, hygiene products, and shelter. Through the Security Council Working Group on Children and on Conflict, the UK works collaboratively to ensure all children's rights are protected throughout the conflict cycle. We defend against attempts to roll back or limit the existing normative CAC framework. And we advocate for the use of important tools, such as the Safe Schools Declaration and the SRSG's, sorry, the SRSG's guidance for mediators to protect children, despite strong opposition from some. 
Promoting the best interests of the child must be the basis of all decisions and actions concerning children in line with the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Each child's experience in conflict is unique and we can only truly understand what is in their best interest by engaging directly with them and by listening. That is why the UK calls for the individual needs of children and youth to be at the heart of all policies, programmes and discussions concerning their future. Children and youth should not be treated as passive subjects or beneficiaries, but equal partners. And we're disappointed to see no youth representation in today's discussion. So Chan, let me conclude by saying that protecting children is a strong investment in our global future. We must not, we cannot cherry pick our human rights obligations to children. Action over rhetoric is key. By collectively strengthening the protection for children, complying with international law and consistently upholding standards of conduct in conflict, we can create a better shared future for children and their wider communities, leaving no one behind. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, also, personally, I might be disagree of your you know, attempt again to, uh, to use references of uh, political politicized nature in a purely humanitarian, noble children agenda. Uh, but anyway, the point is taken. The next speaker in my list is the uh, distinguished deputy permanent representative of India, Mr. Nagarai Naidu. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. At the very outset, we would like to thank the delegations of the Russian Federation and Kazakhstan for organizing today's ARIA meeting and to SRSG Gamba, USG Warrenko and other briefers for sharing the valuable insights on this issue. Our views on the ARIA format of meetings are well known. We do not wish to see this platform being misused to advance a particular viewpoint or political objective. Mr. President, a recent trend in global terrorism is the rising number of children that are recruited and involved in terrorism related activities. For terror groups, children are most susceptible to manipulation, whether as active participants in terror or as human shields, used as guards, spies, cooks, suicide bombers, or human shields. These terror groups understand that children cannot fully grasp the inherent danger of combat, have an underdeveloped sense of right and wrong, and less likely to have divided loyalties. Children are also increasingly the target of coercion, both physical and mental. In other words, they become victims, witnesses and offenders all at the same time. Some of these children are abducted or forcibly recruited. Some are enticed by monetary gains. Some join voluntarily, while others have little or no choice but to accompany their parents or are born into conflict zones to people who have traveled there as foreign fighters. Mr. President, while Resolution 2178 of 2014 defines who foreign terrorist fighters are, there is a general tendency to extend the term to their families. Using the term FTFs of foreign terrorist fighters for children may lead to stigmatization and dehumanization. In this regard, we have taken note of the handbook brought out by the UN Office for Counterterrorism, which uses the broad term, children affected by foreign fighter phenomena. This usage not only affirms the principle that international standards for child rights should apply to all children, regardless of their situation or age, but also protects them to an extent from stigmatization and dehumanization. We are also of the view that, as provided in Article 3 of the Convention of the Rights of the Child, the best interests of the child should remain at the core of any policy related to prosecution, rehabilitation, and reintegration of children of foreign terrorist fighters. Mr. President, the treatment of children affected by the FTF phenomena should be based on the respect, protection, and fulfillment of their rights as defined by the international human rights law, in particular, the Convention on the Rights of the Child and International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, as applied locally by the relevant national laws. The Convention on the Rights of the Child establishes 
states parties obligations to promote the rehabilitation and social integration of children affected by armed conflict in an environment which fosters the health self respect and dignity of the child council resolution 2396 of 2017 also encourages states to develop appropriate legal safeguards to ensure that prr strategies concerning children comply with gender and age sensitivities This obligation was also reiterated by the General Assembly in its sixth review of the Global Counterterrorism Strategy. Mr. President, India recognizes the urgent need for member states to develop tailored context and conflict sensitive approaches to ensure prosecution, repatriation, rehabilitation and reintegration of children of foreign terrorist fighters. However, there are multiple challenges. For instance, the prosecution of FTFs introduces the challenge of collecting, handling, preservation and sharing of relevant information and evidence collected from conflict zones in accordance with domestic law and member states obligations and international law. the situation is further complicated as many children do not have legal documentation there may be situations where a particular member state may not even have a deradicalization or reintegration policy in place it is thus evident that circumstances of the situation will determine whether the children of the foreign terrorist fighters can be taken back or not given national legislation and or the absence of clear evidence for the claim in view of the complexity of the situation we are supportive of any un led effort aimed at identifying solutions informed by an understanding of the rights and interests of the children of foreign terrorist fighters and implemented in a manner that is consistent with the human rights humanitarian law and respective national laws i thank you mr president I'd like to give the floor to the permanent representative of Niger, Ambassador. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, please. Mr. President, I would like to thank the permanent missions of the Russian Federation and the republic of kazakhstan for organizing this important area meeting on the question of repatriation and the fate of children in conflict zones i also thank all the briefers for the quality of their presentations the children and armed conflict agenda has been at the core of our priorities at the security council niger firmly believes in this agenda all children in all situations regardless of their nationality have a right to be treated with dignity to have access to education and learning as further emphasized in the prst/2020/8 which the security council adopted under my country's presidency last september and to have opportunities to grow as citizens in a state that they belong to Mr President in any conflict zone children are the first victims and the most vulnerable and any time a child is affected by conflict it is a tragedy if not for the sake of humanity and the notion of justice the fact that children face unspeakable sufferings for no doing or of their own should prompt us even more to look for ways to eliminate the worst aspect of warfare and most importantly to ensure the physical emotional moral 
and social well-being of children affected by armed conflict. On the notion of rehabilitation, there is near consensus that regardless of all political and geopolitical considerations, that the primary concern is the welfare and best interest of the child. Addressing the plight of children affected by armed conflict is particularly salient in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has exacerbated an already dire situation for these children who, as a result, face acute difficulties in all aspects of lives, well-being, protection, and access to education. Mr. President, the children who find themselves in need of repatriation and reintegration may be anonymous, but every single one of them deserves a chance to live a life of dignity away from violence, indoctrination, and vulnerability. There are no easier answers to the important questions raised by today's meeting, and most of the solutions we recommend here may in practice need to be contextualized. First, the cases of children who find themselves in need of repatriation requires expedient action because time is a constraint. We know that when children reach the minimum age of criminal responsibility or adulthood, while in camps, they are deprived of the right to be treated as children before the law. Also, it has been shown that the earlier action is taken, the higher the likelihood of a successful reintegration. Secondly, given that the question of repatriation and reintegration of children affected by armed conflict raises challenging questions, which sometimes require cooperation between and traditional partners. It is critical that there be more studies on how countries that have repatriated children, for example, from Iraq and Syria, processed. It is no doubt that there are valuable lessons to draw from countries that have repatriated and reintegrated children who are their nationals or children of their nationals. These lessons could add in further informing countries currently grappling with the question of repatriation, but also in shaping the course of the debate within UN agencies, including the Security Council. These studies on, on repatriation, which we believe are direly needed, must also be gender sensitive. Thirdly, it is worth exploring how existing handover protocols can be expanded and tailored to include children in need of repatriation. In the Sahel region, countries such as mine and Mali have adopted handover protocols which facilitate the transfer of children formerly associated with armed groups to child protection services. Even with the existing handover protocols, there is much work to do. However, the existence of a uniform institutional framework is a major step. Lastly, on the role of, the, of that mediators and actors can play, it is, of course, crucial. The practical guidance for mediators to protect children in situations of armed conflict launched in February 2020 provides an existing framework on which we can build. Mr. President, Niger, as a signatory to the Convention of the Rights of the Child, supports that in all situations, the best interest of the child must be the primary consideration. Children do not choose their parents. They are born into conditions that they have no control over. Children belong to those who love them, Mr. President. They should therefore not have to carry the burden of what is beyond that, their control nor be stigmatized for a situation which is not of their doing, nor pay for their parent choices. Two words which we often do not hear in conversations here are courage and compassion. And these are two notions which should be increasingly central to our discussions when considering the plight of these children caught in what is a difficult crossfire. I thank you, Mr. President, for your attention. Thank you, Ambassador, for your statement. 
And now I give the floor uh, to the Deputy Permanent Representative of China, Ambassador Dai Bing, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank SRSG Gamba, USG Kolondorf, and other presenters for their briefings. Foreign children stand in conflicts is a vulnerable group. Their repatriation faces multiple challenges. It is meaningful for Russia and Kazakhstan to convey this meeting, focusing on these children. The good practices shared by Russia, Kazakhstan, and other countries, and the key principles are identified by UNOCT and CTED are of valuable references. Many of these children are victims of terrorism. Thousands of children with links to the terrorist groups are, st are stranded in Syria and Iraq. Similar challenges are present in Somalia, Libya, and the Lake Chad Basin. No, ma no matter why they left their homes, where they are now, and whether their parents are involved in conflicts or terrorist acts, they deserve equal access to all the support they need, including adequate food, safety shelter, and uh, equal opportunity to education. I'd like to emphasize the following points. First, the repatriation and reintegration programs should be designed and implemented in the best interests of these children and in full compliance with the Security Council resolutions and the relevant international laws. The program should be tailored to the specific condition of every children. Mediators are encouraged to give consideration to benefits of these children and facilitate an appropriate solution between the host countries and the countries of origin. Second, the basic needs of these children should be guaranteed. The repatriation and reintegration program needs to offer appropriate psychological support and make sure these children will not suffer from extremism and stigmatization. For those who have not yet been repatriated, host countries and countries of origin share the duty for their protection. The international community should leverage ca 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 capacities to better support them. Third, these children should be provided with avenues for future development and integration into society. All measures should be taken to avoid the children being recruited by the armed and terrorist groups. The international community should help countries of origin to strengthen capacity building and provide a capacity building and provide support in terms of funding, training, and etc. Children are our hope and future. No child, no child should be left behind. Let us take action and give every child in the conflicts solid help and support. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, China, for this statement. And now I give the floor to the Deputy Permanent Representative of Ireland, uh, Ambassador Brian Flynn. Thank you, Chair Gennady, and thank you for taking the initiative to organize this meeting today, calling our attention to the plight of children in conflict zones. I would also like to thank the briefers for their very comprehensive uh, presentations. Colleagues, Syria has been on our minds frequently during today's meeting. At the Security Council last week, we discussed the dire humanitarian situation in Syria, a conflict which, shockingly, has endured now for almost 10 years. That's 10 years of childhood lost and blighted, 10 years of children forced uh, by trauma and suffering to grow up too soon. Ireland, as co-penholder on the Sy Syria humanitarian file, is acutely conscious of the gravity of the situation facing these children. 
in the Al Hall camp, for example, at least half of its 62,000 residents are children under 12 years of age, living in utterly deplorable conditions. We must ensure that rapid, safe and unhindered humanitarian assistance is provided so that the suffering of Syrian children can be alleviated. Mr. Chair, in too many parts of the world, children remain at the front line of armed conflict. COVID-19 has exasperated existing vulnerabilities. We are particularly concerned about the combined impact of conflict and COVID-19 on education, and especially the education of the most marginalized children, such as those living in camps, as well as adolescent girls who are particularly vulnerable to dropping out. We simply cannot countenance the prospect of a generation of children lost to education. For every individual child affected, this is a tragedy. For the world at large, it is a grave risk and a heavy blow to our progress towards achieving the SDGs. Parties to conflict must protect children at all times, including by preventing attacks on schools and hospitals. Mr. Chair, at the heart of our shared efforts on the children and armed conflict agenda are the core principles of best, of best interests of the child and the child as a rights holder. In conflict, children are always primarily victims, no matter their association with or used by actors in war. Children who have been recruited in violation of international law by armed forces and armed groups, including those accused of having committed crimes, should be treated primarily as victims of serious violations who require reintegration support. Ireland was pleased to join the Group of Friends of Reintegration at its foundation in 2019. We look forward to continuing to work with SRSG Gamba to advance our shared efforts to ensure that all children, including those who have been associated with armed groups, have the support they need to reintegrate into society and enjoy the freedoms of childhood. In addition, we hope to make a constructive contribution to the Working Group on Children and Armed Conflict and through the Group of Friends of Children and Armed Conflict. Ireland has had its own experience of repatriation. This has shown us that repatriation of children from conflict zones can raise specific and complex challenges. But where children are involved, their welfare and safety must, of course, be of paramount concern. Mr. Chair, in 2020, we celebrated 30 years of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the most widely ratified human rights treaty in history. The central tenant of that convention is that the best interests of the child shall be a primary consideration. That is what guides Ireland's approach. Our commitment to upholding human rights and international humanitarian law will under underpin everything we do as a member of the Security Council. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Brian. Next speaker in, in my list is the uh, Deputy Permanent Representative of Estonia. Uh, please, Gerd. Thank you, Gennady. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we thank all panelists for their interventions. Uh, a year ago, we gathered here for a presentation of the report of the Commission of Inquiry on Syria, which provided a damning overview of the serious and widespread violations against children by all parties to the conflict during the previous nine years. It also reflected the Syrian government's continued disregard toward its obligations under international law for vast numbers of children killed, wounded and maimed, detained and tortured. The Security Council has also heard repeated reports of deliberate targeting of schools and hospitals in violation of international humanitarian law. We are now also one year into the first reduction of uh, cross-border aid to Syria, a decision that seriously damaged our capacity to support Syrian civilians, among whom children are the most vulnerable. To recall our continued position on children and armed conflict, Estonia continues to call for an end to all grave violations against children in armed conflict and for respect for and accountability under international law in Syria and elsewhere. We work for these goals nationally and as a member of the Council. We continue to support the Secretary General's Special Representative on Children and Armed Conflict and UNICEF in their activities. Supporting children affected by conflict remains a priority in our bilateral development and humanitarian assistance. Estonia is committed to fulfilling its international obligations. 
For us, in all actions, the best interest of the child shall be primary consideration. The Security Council has recognized the importance of providing sustainable, timely, and appropriate reintegration and rehabilitation assistance to children affected by armed conflict. It is important to provide all children with a safe and protective environment. A child who has lived in a harmful environment needs specialized support to adjust and adapt to society. Resocialization is a key issue. It is important to address the individual needs of the child and to provide the support needed to ensure that they regain a chance for a hopeful future. I thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Estonia. And now I give the floor uh, to the representative of Mexico. Mr. Chair, Mexico thanks the missions of Russia and Kazakhstan, as well as the Office of the SRSG for Children and Armed Conflict for convening this area meeting. The promotion and respect for children's rights is one of Mexico's main priorities. And as a firm supporter of the Children and Armed Conflict mandate, we strongly reject any activity that contravenes the right to the well-being of children and youth who continue to be victims of a concerning number of human rights violations. In this regard, we underline that the best interests of the child shall always be our primary guiding principle. International legal standards pertaining to children must be fully upheld and cannot be undermined or diminished regardless of the age of the child. Policies and narratives that tend to re-victimize them and propagate harmful stereotypes should be avoided at all costs. They should have uninterrupted access to basic services, such as food, shelter, medical treatment, and education. We are extremely concerned about the inhumane conditions in camps. Children's physical and mental health needs uh, are to become our primary concern. It is crucial to provide adequate medical and psychosocial support. Failing to do so will have negative consequences for the rest of their lives. Mexico calls upon all member states to ensure a safe and orderly repatriation, reintegration, and rehabilitation of children in camps, particularly in northern Syria and Iraq, in accordance with Security Council Resolution 2396, as well as with the key princi principles for the protection, repatriation, prosecution, rehabilitation, and reintegration of women and children, including the fact that children should not be separated from their families. The integration of a children's rights perspective into efforts to prevent and combat terrorism uh, as a human right and a humanitarian imperative is of paramount importance. Consular assistance should be provided to support repatriation, identifying and caring for unaccompanied and separated children. Member states should also issue the necessary documents to guarantee a child's right to an identity. We wish to highlight that repatriation of children must never violate the principle of non refoulement especially when there are grounds for believing that they would be at risk of violations to their human rights. The support by UNICEF and civil society is key for member states to fulfill their obligations of recovery and reintegration. In that regard, the specific risks that girls face cannot be underscored enough. It is vital to allow for gender sensitive programming that ensure girls' agency in their own reintegration process. Children are resilient. They are fully capable of recovering from experiences of violence, and they have a great potential to become agents of positive change in their communities when provided with reintegration support. Mr. Chair, the Working Group on Children and Armed Conflict should collaborate closely with other subsidiary bodies, particularly with the counterterrorism committees to promote coordination and synergies in their actions. In that regard, the protection of human rights while countering terrorism remains a fundamental premise. Mediators and other international, regional, and national actors involved in peace negotiations should play a more relevant role to deal with the repatriation, rehabilitation, and reintegration of children in armed conflicts. In this regard, the practical guidance for mediators to protect children in situations of armed conflict and the technical note of girls associated with armed forces and armed groups are both valuable tools for implementing best practices related to prevention of recruitment and use, release, and reintegration. To conclude, 
let us not forget that what we are dealing with here is with the perspective for many of these children and girls of a life lived in peace and in social harmony. This is the most fragile issue in our hands, and we should not spare any efforts in offering a better tomorrow to future generations that are being deprived of their happiness by war and conflict. I thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your statement. And now I give the floor to the representative of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, we thank the permanent missions of the Russian Federation and Kazakhstan and the Office of the Special Representative on Children and Armed Conflict for convening this important meeting and to the distinguished briefers for their remarks. St. Vincent and the Grenadines remains committed to working with member states on strengthening the protection of children who, no, through no fault of their own, are drawn into violent conflict in several regions of the world. We welcome the release of some children from detention centers in recent months in the DRC, Mali, Central African Republic, Myanmar, Colombia, and Yemen, particularly given the risk posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. However, we underscore that the release of children must be supported by well-resourced and tailored reintegration programs. Indeed, governments face tremendous, there are no one size fits all solutions or easy answers to this common responsibility we have to its children in conflict away from home. We encourage countries with successful repatriation and reintegration programs to share knowledge and lessons learned with others to repatriate and reintegrate their own nationals. Even through this area meeting today, much has been shared on the successes of Russia and Kazakhstan in carrying out this critical task and we commend you. Capacity building should be made available to states upon request so that they can voluntarily and adequately manage the process of bringing children home and back into society. Moreover, the approach to repatriation and reintegration should be long-term, multi-stakeholder, and cut across the nexus of humanitarian development and peace-building activities. Children associated with war and terrorist groups should be treated primarily as victims, and the best interests of the child should be a paramount consideration. Simultaneously, we must consider the impact of repatriation of children, especially those of foreign terrorist fighters on the country of origin. Many of the children have been radicalized, abused and harmed and need appropriate assistance upon their return to their home countries. Further, the society at large in the countries of origin must be sensitized to ensure the children's inclusion in society, which is critical to prevent a second wave of violence against these minors, the violence of exclusion. Further, homegrown terrorism and extremism must be closely monitored and countered in order to prevent them from falling into domestic terrorist networks. In many cases, we cannot separate the issues of repatriation of children from the repatriation of the mothers of these children. While we may analyze these issues separately, in practice, we must treat with them at one and the same time. Before coming to the end of my intervention, allow me to reiterate that counterterrorism operations do not absolve parties of their obligations under international humanitarian and human rights law, and proper care should be taken not to harm children during these operations. Also, strategies to prevent radicalization leading to violent extremism should be specifically tailored with children in mind. In conclusion, some vexing questions remain. Due to the impossibility of retroactive application of relevant laws in some countries and a dearth of evidence, there is sometimes no way to hold parents accountable for joining terrorist networks, bringing their children along. In this context, how do we ensure that the cycle of radicalization leading to violent extremism and terrorism does not continue at home? How can we better support capacity constrained countries, including with funding, to help facilitate repatriation, reintegration, and rehabilitation of children. And finally, what can be done? What is the current status of a UN data set on the number, nationality, gender, and age of individuals associated with ISIL who are being held in camps in Northern Syria and in Iraq? Is there a clear objective to establish such a data set and what actions can we take in this regard? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Next speaker is the representative of France. Uh, 
Merci et bonjour, Monsieur le Président. Um, I would like to thank the Russian Federation and Kazakhstan for convening and organizing this meeting and all the briefers for their presentations and remarks. The children and armed conflict agenda illustrated what the Security Council can do best when united around a common priority. I said by the US Volnkov, we should bear in mind that grave violation of international humanitarian law and human rights are two problem and those violations continue, unfortunately, in Syria, Iraq, and Libya, among other countries. Moreover, and because of the disproportionate impact of the pandemic COVID-19, we must resolutely pursue our action in this regard. France has been committed to the protection of children in armed conflict since the creation of the CACC agenda. We have played a leading role in the creation of the monitoring and reporting mechanism and the working group on children and armed conflict. In 2007, we hosted the conference Free Children from War, together with UNICEF, which led to the adoption of the Paris Commitment. Those commitments remain fully relevant today. This meeting is an opportunity for us to call once again for the universal endorsement of the principle and commitment. We renew our support for child protection actors, including UNICEF, the Office of the Special Representative Regina Gambia and civil society. We further support a number of projects that improve the daily lives of children in areas of armed conflict. We support, other, among other actors, uh, actions, educational continuity in Libya, reconstructive surgery for wounded and mutilated children in Iraq, the reintegration of former child soldiers in Nigeria and Niger to Central African Republic and Mali. We also welcome, in this context, the signing of an action plan between the United Nations and the Syrian Democratic Force to end the recruitment and use of child soldiers. We must take into account first and foremost that criminal action of terrorist group, particularly Daesh and Al-Qaeda, have an unbearable impact on children. We firmly believe that unlike the parents, children did not choose to go to Iraq and Syria. They do not choose to join terrorism. Children are not at fault, and to quote our colleagues from the US, they are primary victims. This is why we consider taking into account the best interest of the child, that the most vulnerable, orphan, and isolated minor should be repatriated as soon as condition permitted. Since 2019, we have organized the return of several children. The last operation was conducted in January 13, 2021, and allowed the return of seven young French minors who were in the northwest of Syria. These children, who were particularly vulnerable, were welcomed in accordance with the authorization given by local officials. Upon their arrival in France, they received psychosocial support and followed by social services. However, we must keep in mind that these operations are difficult and require a great deal of effort, given the security context, but also the unprecedented health crisis we are experiencing. France has no jurisdiction over the camp where these children are held and does not ensure effective control of these territories. Therefore, the repatriation we were able to carry out in a war zone were only carried out after complex negotiation with local authorities and when there were no risk for the safety of children. And as recalled by Special Representative Vangeli Gamba, those safety conditions lies primarily on local and national authorities. Last but not least, I would like to emphasize that our effort on behalf of children do not change for France's consistent position regarding adult foreign terrorist fighters. We believe that there can be no impunity for the crime committed by Daesh and that all terrorists must be held accountable as close as possible to the place where the crimes were committed, where the evidence of their action can be found and where reparation for the harm caused must be granted. I thank you. Uh, thank you, France. Uh, and next, I would appreciate the statement of the representative of Tunisia. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, 
I think the Russian Federation, um, Kazakhstan, and the Office of the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict for co-organizing this meeting on this important and complex issue of repatriation of children from conflict zones. I also would like to thank uh, SRSG Gamba and USG Voronkov for their briefings. Innocent children continue to endure unspeakable and unacceptable suffering in unsafe and insecure environments across conflicts and crises. Rather than protected, many are used and abused by armed and terrorist groups and end up stranded in shelters, displacement camps and detention facilities across hotbeds of tension, of terrorism and of violent extremism. The COVID-19 pandemic has made vulnerabilities in conflicts only worse with excessively disproportionate and adverse impacts on children. It hindered urgent coping mechanisms as well as long-term solutions for children affected by conflict. Tunisia remains committed to the rights and well-being of children and its party to core international humanitarian law, human rights law, refugee law, and accountability instruments that seek to protect children from violations and abuses in armed conflict situations. The guiding principle related to the best interest of the child is well enshrined in the Tunisian constitution. Therefore, we are following the issue of children stranded in conflict zones with utmost attention. In this regard, Tunisian authorities undertook the repatriation of a number of our children from Libya last year and provided them with the needed health care and psychological support and follow up as part of physical and psychological recovery, family reunification and social reintegration programs. We recognize, however, that the process of repatriation of children trapped in conflict zones is not exempt from challenges related particularly to the need of identification of their nationality, as well as verification of their potential involvement in terrorism related crimes. Thus, forensic, legal and judicial requirements need to be fulfilled to enable efficient repatriation. The COVID-19 pandemic has unfortunately compounded these challenges and impacted cooperation, coordination and proceedings. But we believe it is fundamental to address these gaps, challenges and vulnerabilities. We believe also that the protection of children starts with conflict prevention. In this regard, key emphasis should be placed on combating poverty, marginalization and inequality by promoting access to education, social inclusion and sustainable development. It is also crucial to mainstream child protection into peace processes and consider involving them in post-conflict re recovery and reconstruction efforts so as to cement the fabric of the society, save future generations and enhance prospects of long-term positive peace. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the presidency of the Security Council for the statement, uh, the representative of Tunisia. And uh, this uh, ends the list of speakers from the Security Council members. Now, as announced, uh, we plan to extend our meeting and now uh, we will hear the statements of uh, representatives of non-member states, uh, UN member states, but non member of the Security Council. So uh, the speaker list will be open with the permanent representative of Iraq, followed by a permanent representative of Syrian Arab Republic and the public of Uzbekistan. Your Excellency, permanent representative of Iraq, your floor is yours. Thank you, Excellency, Mr. Chairman. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Russia Federation, Kazakhstan, and the Office of Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict for convening this area formula meeting. And I also thank the distinguished briefers for their remarks. This meeting is indeed timely and relevant. Mr. Chairman, lately the world seems 
to be lurching from one crisis to another. We have experienced a global pandemic, dramatic changes to how we conduct our daily lives, economic uncertainty and political and social turmoil, as well as an array of natural disasters. Then there is the outstanding issues of tourism and its negative impact on every aspect of life, especially, but not limited, the indescribable harm it caused to the welfare of Iraqi children affected by conflicts and its brutal violence and hardship. Excellencies, my country suffered severely from terrorism. It brought untold humanitarian, <coughs> excuse me, untold humanitarian complications to the population, especially those of the impacted area. And children were at the core of the dire situation. Therefore, the government of Iraq, communal and political leaders and wide spectrum of esteemed clerks of different religions and sects shoulder their efforts through national reconciliation process to rebuild trust and bring stability to the country as whole, while advocating and promoting the rights and welfare of children with their best interest as the paramount consideration. Though the road to achieve the aspirations of the people is yet to be fulfilled. But we as Iraqis are determined and full of hope for, of a better future of for all. Mr. Chairman, children and, and, and the safeguarding of their future is lies at the core of the Iraqi government policies. Therefore, we spare no effort to communicate with all the countries to coordinate the safe return and repatriation of foreign children captured during the fight against Daesh. Iraq would like to thank the Secretary General for raising the call upon all countries concerned to facilitate the voluntary repatriation of foreign children in line with the international law principles. Iraq appreciates the support and the assistance of friends and allies also applauds those countries which have agreed to repatriate their children. In conclusion, Iraq is determined and committed to work with all member states and concerned United Nations agencies and bodies, especially the Security Council and the Office of SRSG for CAAC to find the best strategies and plans to further protect children. Unfortunately, Daesh has invested heavily in the radicalization and brainwash of children to make sure they can outlive their imminent collapse. Therefore, Iraq still needs the assistance and support of the United Nations, friends and allies to provide those children with the needed help, support and guidance to recover from what they had witnessed. The fight against Daesh has highlighted some loopholes in number of laws. Therefore, the concerned authorities has presented the draft bill on the, on the rights of child, of the child in a broader concept that includes articles criminalizing the recruitment and use of children. Finally, Iraq is working tirelessly to protect and rehabilitate Iraqi children and reintegrate them and their families in the society through tailored national policies designed to serve the purpose and the desired objectives. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do appreciate your valuable words, uh, Ambassador. And uh, now I give the floor to the permanent representative of Syria, Dr. Bashar Jafari. Thank you so much, my dear colleague. Uh, 
First of all, let me thank the permanent delegations of the Russian Federation and the Republic of Kazakhstan for holding this important session at a time when the whole world is witnessing the dire situation of children trapped in areas controlled by terrorist organizations, proxy militias or illegal entities. I also thank Mrs. Anna Kuznetsova, Presidential Commissioner for Children's Rights of the Russian Federation, for her great efforts in this field and her engagement in serious and constructive cooperation with the government of my country, which resulted in the return of tens of thousands, ten, tens of children of, uh, to their countries, mainly, mainly speaking Russia, Kazakhstan, Albania, and others. Mr. President, terrorism is considered one of the most dangerous scourges that afflict any state and society. And when terrorism spreads with its criminal manifestations, the primary victims of it are definitely children. This harm is evident in various manifestations. The more complex picture of this harm is also evident in the phenomenon of terrorist and illegal entities recruitment of children and their involvement in terrorist acts and related crimes. The millennia-aged historic theater of Palmyra was a witness to this, as a number of children recruited by the terrorist organization ISIS executed 25 Syrian soldiers, filming and documenting this atrocious act and posting it later on the internet to serve its criminal agendas. Of course, unlike confiscating some presidential Twitter accounts, none of the giant social media corporations back then bothered to delete or prohibit the, and the accounts displaying that horrific content online. Apparently, their understanding of free expression is very awkward. Furthermore, terrorist groups and the puppet separatist militias of the SDF are committing serious crimes and violations against the children of my country, Syria, including murder, maiming, kidnapping, recruitment, and the transfer of children to conflict areas in the countries of the region, burning and destroying schools and hospitals, and their militarization, obstructing and preventing the teaching process. That is why we are surprised that the conditions of children in Syria are addressed outside the real context and ignore the root causes of the grave violations that the children of Syria suffer, especially terrorism, aggression, foreign occupation, and unilateral coercive measures imposed by countries such as the United States and the European Union. What makes matters worse is that certain countries refuse to take back their citizens, including the women and the children of ISIS terrorist fighters. Rather, those countries have gone even further by endeavoring to revoke their nationalities and passports if they dare think of returning to their countries of origin. The government of the Syrian Arab Republic reiterates its condemnation and categorical rejection of the signing of the special representative of the Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflicts of the so-called June 2019 action plan with the so-called Syrian Democratic Forces, which is an armed separatist militia supported by the American occupation forces in the northeast of my country. This step by which the special representative of the Secretary General is trying to legitimize this armed separatist militia is a flagrant violation of the principles of the United Nations Charter and the Security Council relevant resolution, which all affirm the strong commitment to the sovereignty, unity, and territorial integrity of the Syrian Arab Republic. 
the special representative signature of the above called plan and her continued promotion of it confirms her biased stance about the situation in my country, Syria, and undermines any opportunity for cooperation with her mandate. Mr. President, the only legal way for states to take back their citizens of children of terrorist organizations, including those in Al Hol camp and other camps and detention centers controlled by the separatist IDS militia, the agents of the American occupation, is through cooperation and coordination with the government of my country and through official channels. We have recently witnessed the tragic death of several children when trying to smuggle them in a, in a water tank from a whole camp as a prelude to smuggling them abroad. We have also witnessed a number of delegations of Western countries such as US, Canada, Belgium, France, Sweden, Austria, and recently Catalonia and others illegally sneaking across our borders with neighboring countries to the regions of northeastern Syria without prior coordination with the government of the Syrian Arab Republic or obtaining its approval or the duly necessary entry visas. My government sent two official letters in this regard on June 27 to the President of the Security Council and the Secretary General of the United Nations. This behavior harms children detained by these entities and separates them from their families, as was the case for Belgium, whose government has explicitly announced its desire to take back the Belgian children of ISIS terrorists without their mothers. Of course, let us not forget here how Syrian children trapped in areas under control of terrorist groups have been brutalized by using them in organ trafficking and forced early marriages. Finally, Syrian state institutions, including the Ministry of Social Affairs and Labor, are making enormous efforts, despite considerable pressure, to protect and care for the group of children for, found in areas liberated from terrorism or who have reached the custody of state institutions. I thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, now I give the floor of the, to, the, to the permanent representative of Uzbekistan, His Excellency, uh, Bakhtiar Bragimov. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, let me commend the permanent mission of the Russian Federation and the Republic of Kazakhstan, as well as the Office of the Special Representative of the Sector General for the Armed for the uh, children and armed conflict for convening today's Security Council area formally meeting on the repatriation of children from the conflict zone in the Middle East. I would like also to thank all previous speakers for their comprehensive and informative presentation. Today in my intervention, I would like to share with you Uzbekistan experience in addressing the issue of repatriation of women and children from Syria and Iraq, which was conducted in close collaboration with the United Nations agencies. Mr. Chair, Uzbekistan has been among the first countries to conduct the large-scale repatriation of its citizens from Syria and Iraq. The president of our country, His Excellency Shavkat Mizioyev, has directed relevant agencies of Uzbekistan to execute special operations, Mekhar 1, Mekhar 2, and Mekhar 3, Mercy 1, 2, and 3, to repatriate our nationals, mainly women and children, from the conflict zone in the Middle East. These operations were carried out in May and October of 2019 and in December last year. The main goal of this operation was to facilitate our citizens safely return to Uzbekistan and their reintegration back into society. As our president stressed at his recent annual address to the national parliament, quote, regardless of wherever the citizens of Uzbekistan are, their constitutional rights should be protected, end of quote. Altogether, 318 women and children were returned from Syria and Iraq. The government has granted amnesty 
to returning women and children over the age of 14. This decision has become one of the key factors that encourage our citizens to return home. Herein, we have treated children mainly as victims in line with international law and the Convention on the Rights of Child. Next May will mark the second anniversary of the first repatriation. Therefore, we can summarize the initial result and analyze the lesson learned. I hope that the experience of Uzbekistan will be useful to other countries that have currently their own citizens in the conflict zone. In this regard, I would like to highlight the three most important conditions for success in conducting the repatriation and reintegration of women and children in their own countries. First, consideration of effort and close coordination among various state agencies. For example, prior to the repatriation, the government of Uzbekistan has developed and adopted an interagency action plan to support returning women and children. This roadmap has laid its own foundation for creating a favorable environment for returnees. Upon returning to Uzbekistan, the integration of each family, reintegration of each family and child has required the settlement of legal issues, provision of emergency medical and psychological assistance and rehabilitation support, allocation of housing to those who have lost it, ensuring access to education for children with serious knowledge gap, including forcibly married minor mothers who must complete their education and receive a school certificate, ensuring the employment and economic independence of women who often had neither professional education nor social skill necessary for employment, provision of social benefit. Secondly, it's important to ensure the prompt reunification of returnees with their families and communities to prevent the isolation or living in rehabilitation institution on a permanent or a long-term basis. After two or three weeks of studying the situation, the returnees were integrated with relatives or at their place of residence where they used to live in. There were 18 guardian families identified to provide support to separated and unaccompanied children. These are relatives who have been found suitable as guardians. Some of them received child support benefit. An initial analysis of the reintegration process shows that community and family are instrumental for positive results. Mothers, some of whom are still minor, receive economic and moral support from their families and communities. Children who are adopted by relatives or placed with foster families gain self-confidence and show good signs of recovery, such as better bonding with their caregivers, experiencing less threat and improved academic performance. Thirdly, providing psychosocial support to returnees. Some returnees need specialized psychosocial support for extended period of time, including months or even years, to successfully reintegrate back into society. This requires assistance from international organizations. The close cooperation with UNICEF, along with its technical support, was one of the major factors that allowed Uzbekistan to succeed. UNICEF has helped to train specialists to work with children and families by providing them with regular professional support. Currently, Uzbekistan is working with UNICEF to institutionalize these services into the social protection system. All in all, Uzbekistan attaches great importance to the issue of returning its nationals from the conflict zone and stands ready to continue its collaboration with relevant UN agencies and other foreign parties to repatriate women and children back to their own country. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your statement. Would appreciate it. And now I give the floor uh, to the representative of Belgium. As far as I understand, Karen here, the, uh, the president of the working group of the Security Council for the year of 2018-2020. Please. Um, thank you so much, Mr. President, dear Gennady, and um, dear colleagues. Children are the most vulnerable among us, and acts of terrorism affect them in multiple ways. 
In situations of armed conflict, some of them are being exploited and recruited by armed and terrorist groups. Others are taken away by their parents who leave their home countries for the purpose of participating in terrorist activities. Others still are born in conflict zones and have never known a place they can call home. When tackling this issue, we always have to differentiate the status of children from those of adults. All policies and actions related to children affected by terrorism should be firmly based on the principle of the best interest of the child and the affected children should be treated first and foremost as victims. Like many countries, Belgium is faced with the situation of children associated with foreign terrorist fighters and their repatriation. The issue of their safe return is a concern for all relevant partners and we believe that in order to address this complex and multi-phase problem, a coordinated and multidisciplinary approach is needed. Psychomedical attention must be provided at all stages of the process, from repatriation to social and educational reintegration in line with international standards. Throughout the process, throughout the process states must respect their obligation under the Convention on the Rights of the Child and its core principle of the best interests interest of the child. The Belgian government remains committed to the return of children of Belgian nationality associated with FTFs in the Syrian Iraqi conflict zone, in particular from the camps in northeastern Syria, in line with recommendations of the Secretary General's 2020 report on children and armed conflict. In June 2009, the Belgian authorities organized the repatriation of six children whose situation was particularly vulnerable. As recently as 25 December of last year, only a month ago, another child was repatriated. We will continue to work with all parties concerned in order to bring back the remaining Belgian children. My government is determined in this regard. Yet, this process also faces considerable challenges. The, establish, the establishment of affiliation in order to determine the child's Belgian nationality, legal and political challenges resulting from the specific context of a war-torn country, difficult access to the region due to security reasons. These difficulties have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Given the current security and health situation in the camps, Belgium is also working on improving the living conditions through our action in the coalition against Daesh and via the European Union. As a former chair of the Security Council Working Group on Children and Armed Conflict and sponsor of the Handbook on Children Affected by the Phenomenon of Foreign Combatants, Belgium reaffirms its strong commitment to protecting children affected by armed conflict. We call in particular for the full implementation of the conclusions of the Working Group on CAG on the Syrian Arab Republic. We call on all parties to take the, measure, the necessary measures to fulfill their obligations under international human rights humanitarian and refugee law. This, the plight of children would be greatly improved if all actors respected these obligations, in particular with regards to granting humanitarian access and preventing attacks on schools and hospitals. Dear colleagues, in conclusion, I want to encourage the use of the practical guidance for mediators to protect children in situations of armed conflict. These guidelines offer a tool on how to give due consideration to child protection issues from the early stages of peace processes, as well as to peace agreements that put strong emphasis on the best interest of the child, the treatment of children separated from armed groups as victims, and the focus on family and community-based reintegration. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Belgium. Uh, now I give the floor to the permanent representative of Ecuador, Mr. Christian Spinoza. Thank you very much. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I thank the Russian Federation, Kazakhstan, and the Office of the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict for organizing and sponsoring this relevant uh, ARIA Formula meeting on children and armed uh, conflict. We follow with interest the presentations uh, the, today. I thank all the briefers for these uh, presentations. Today, I will focus on three central points uh, for my delegation. First, I wish to reiterate Ecuador's commitment with the global efforts on the promotion and protection 
of the rights of the child. On June 9, uh, 2020, Ecuador joined the group of friends on children in armed conflict to further promote the work of the international community to protect the children. On 21st March last year, Ecuador also formalized its adherence to the Vancouver principles on the maintenance of peace and the prevention of the recruitment, recruitment and use of child soldiers. Although there have been important advances, the situation of children in armed conflict still reflects a devastating reality as shown in the Secretary General's reports uh, document S slash 2020 slash 525 issued in June 2020. Ecuador is also making significant efforts at the regional level to combat the trafficking of minors and their recruitment. But this is a global challenge that concerns the entire international community. This is an additional reason to expand and support, for example, the Peace Building Fund. Solidarity is central to support not only countries transitioning from conflict to peace, but also to ensure cross-border cooperation in affected areas. As an organization, we must address the situation of children in conflict zones and camps worsened by the pandemic. Fragilities and vulnerabilities have been exacerbated by COVID-19. Humanitarian access to conflict zones have been affected, which brings me to my second point. The best way to ensure the safety and security for all children is by implementing the Secretary General's call for all global ceasefire as a first step for permanent peace. It is for that reason that together with Malaysia, Bangladesh, Egypt, Slovenia, Japan, Jamaica, Oman, Senegal, and Sweden, we co-initiated the joint declaration supporting the ceasefire. During this year, 2021, it remains key to ensure the implementation of Security Council Resolution 2532. It is also essential that the Security Council adopts another resolution on COVID-19 with the aim of facilitating and updating every possible tool to ensure an effective and comprehensive response from the Council to address the persisting challenges of the pandemic and to save and, and alleviate the suffering of those more than 420 million children living in conflict zones. This brings me to my third and last point. All measures taken by member states for the protection, repatriation, rehabilitation, and reintegration of children should be in full compliance with international law and international human rights law and guided by the Security Council and General Assembly resolutions. Let's not forget that children are victims in conflict settings and that everyone has the right to return home. In the same way, every action must be taken according to the best interest of the child. Before concluding, I take this opportunity to insist once again on the urgency of strengthening the Office of the Special Representative of the Secretary General on Children in Armed Conflict, Victoria Gamba, especially in the context of increased pressure and challenges resulting from the pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much for, for, the, for your statement. And now it's a pleasure to give the floor to the permanent representative of Kyrgyz Republic, Her Excellency, Regul Moldesayeva. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, let me express my gratitude to organizers of today's UN Security Council Open Area Formula Meeting. I would like to thank Ms. Virginia Gemba, SRSG for Children and Armed Conflict, Mr. Vladimir Varankov, USG for Counterterrorism, Ms. Anna Kuznetsova, Presidential Commissioner for Children's Rights of the Russian Federation, Mr. Marjan Ilyas of PR of Kazakhstan, and all participants for their very informative addresses. Dear colleagues, 
in recent years, a number of citizens of the Kyrgyz Republic, including entire families, have left for Syria, Iraq, and other conflict zones. Currently, the government of Kyrgyzstan is studying this issue. The working group established by the decision of my government is taking appropriate measures to determine the exact location and number of Kyrgyz citizens for possible repatriation from the territory of Syria and Iraq as part of the planned humanitarian mission. It should be noted the continued conflict in Syria, as well as the COVID-19 pandemic, are creating significant obstacles to the process of the repatriation of women and children. Among other significant problems are the lack of resources and experience in conducting special humanitarian operations of citizens' repatriation from the conflict zones, as well as identification of those citizens, especially children. Most of the children do not have identity documents, and there is an urgent need for conducting of DNA tests of each unidentified child. In this regard, we welcome and are ready to further support uh, efforts and initiatives when OCT and to participate in its relevant programs and projects. The process of returning of those individuals and their families requires a set of actions. This is a complex process consisting of many stages. We do recognize necessity of realization of practical steps aimed to protection, repatriation, prosecution, rehabilitation, and reintegration of indivi individuals returning from the conflict zones, including development of programs of support theoreticalization and social rehabilitation of family members of foreign terrorist fighters. Kyrgyzstan strongly supports efforts of all UN member states, UN entities, and other donors to support national institutions, UN agencies, and civil society organizations working to implement relevant activities. In this context, Kyrgyzstan is interested in active cooperation with the UN and all international partners in some of the most urgent issues on the children and armed conflict agenda. In conclusion, Mr. Chair, I would like especially welcome the appointment of the Regional Coordination Officer on Foreign Terrorist Fighters of the United Nations Counterterrorism Office based in Bishkek in my country, Kyrgyzstan, and covering all Central Asian states. The government of Kyrgyz Republic fully supports the Regional Coordination Coordination officer in his mission. Thank you. Thank you very much for your statement and for the information you provided. And uh, now I give the floor uh, to the permanent representative of Nigeria, Dr. Tijeni Mohamed Bande. Excellencies, let me from the answer thank the permanent missions of the Russian Federation and the Republic of Kazakhstan for organizing today's really important meeting. We also thank the Special Representative of the Secretary General on Children and Armed Conflict and other briefers for their really useful briefings. Terrorism and violent extremism are amongst the most challenging forms of armed conflict of our time. They pose serious threat to civilian populations, especially children who are vulnerable to violence, abuse, sexual exploitation, and recruitment at the hands of terrorists. Furthermore, the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the plight of many children in armed conflict zones worldwide, heightening their vulnerability to exploitation and recruitment, as well as the deprivation of basic services, including healthcare and education. Nigeria had, since 2013, contended with incessant attacks by Boko Haram terrorist groups, resulting in the abduction of more than 1,000 children, including 276 girls taken from their school dormitory at night in the town of Chibok in the northeast of Nigeria in 2014. Seven years on from the tragic incident, more than 100 girls have yet to be returned to their family, even though uh, last week we had the news that many of them have escaped. So we, we have some progress in this regard. In the wake of this, another grave attack was carried out at a school in the same area where five girls lost their lives. Excellency, as the fight against the Boko Haram terrorist group continues in Nigeria and the neighboring countries of Cameroon, Chad, and, and Nigeria Republic, the affected governments have sought for a comprehensive approach to forestall a repeat of the situation, which has also been suffered by 
in the countries of Syria and Iraq, in the context of, of ISIL. Working closely with its contiguous neighbors, Nigeria, through several existing platforms, including the multinational joint task force, MNJTF, has pushed Boko Haram out of several provinces in the northeastern part of the country and secured, secured the release of the abducted civilians, mostly women and children. Although substantial progress has been made in reducing the threat of this phenomenon in Nigeria and the Lake Chad region, the group continues to demonstrate a resolve for targeting children and other vulnerable groups. The government of Nigeria signed a tripartite agreement in 2017 in Yaoundé, Cameroon, with the objective to ensure the successful return, reintegration, and rehabilitation of children freed from their abductors. Authorities are currently supporting victims of the terrorist group by rebuilding their communities, provision of basic amenities, and other measures that further enhance their integration into society. Authorities at various levels recognize the diversity of the children's backgrounds and substantial financial resources have been put into developing education and skills to suit their individual needs and discourage further recruitment. Excellencies, the United Nations Cultural and Educational Fund, UNICEF, has partnered and rendered assistance to the Nigerian authorities by providing reintegration services to all children released under the action plan signed with the Civilian Joint Task Force, CJTF, a local group formed to support the fight against Boko Haram, Boko Haram terrorist group and to protect local communities. Nigeria has also pledged its support for UN counter-tourism efforts for the prevention of terrorist attacks. Like many other nations battling the, the scourge of terrorism, Nigeria has deployed several common vulnerabilities and exposure mechanisms to address the root causes of child recruitment by extremist groups and aid in the deradicalization of repentant insurgent fighters. Although these initiatives have led to the successful reintegration of some ex-militants and their families, a sizable number are still faced with the difficulty of regaining acceptance into their former communities. Children that are victims of such societal exclusion as a result of their association with the terrorist group are also highly vulnerable to recruitment. We are grateful to the Security Council for creating a strong normative framework to end and prevent grave violations against children in situations of armed conflict. Resolution 2427 of 2018 reaffirmed that children associated with armed groups, including those having committed crimes during armed conflict, should be treated as victims. In addition, the government of Nigeria is now more resilient against potential attacks by armed groups. It is also readily disposed, disposed to further collaboration with UNICEF and through society organizations to end all forms of violence against children. We support universal standards for the handover and repatriation of children and also urge for consideration of additional measures that particularly support and address the peculiarities of certain reg regions towards the successful handover and repatriation processes as applicable. In conclusion, Mr. Moderator, Excellencies, all relevant UN organs and regional organizations must continue to prioritize the protection of children in armed conflict and work together to prevent and end the sick grave violations against children. When it's a situation that creates the enabling environment for the repatriation and integration of children in conflict areas, and particularly from temporary camps to their original communities and homes should be sustained for the much needed physical, mental, and spiritual stability given their traumatic experience at the hands of their captors. Clearly, nothing is at the center of the values of the United Nations than the more urgent or more urgent than looking after the welfare of children, especially those in conflict situations. We should provide this, we should support this with every effort. I thank you. I, I thank your excellency for a statement and now uh, I kindly ask to speak his excellency uh, the permanent representative of Sri Lanka uh, Mr. Mohan Paris. Uh, thank you Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman having listened to uh, the presentations this morning I was wondering whether we as members of the global family should be really saying mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. 
through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. It is a tragic story, isn't it? I was reminded of the biblical Psalm, Psalm 127 verses three to five, which says, behold, children are a gift from our creator. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hands of the warrior, so are children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies at the gate. Mr. Chairman, the irony is that the world does not place a high value on children, particularly in the context of armed conflict. It is a matter of record that 415 million children live in conflict affected areas. In high intensity conflict areas, it is a staggering 149 million, which is double the number of children in the United States. Mr. Chairman, having said that, I wish to thank the permanent missions of the Russian and, the, and Kazakhstan and the UN Special Representative of the Secretary General on Children and Armed Conflict for organizing this discussion on a very important topic. Sad topic, really. I also thank Mr. Voronkov, Under Secretary General for Counterterrorism and other briefers for, as I said, their soul searching insightful presentations. I cannot but quote the late Nelson Mandela who said, quote, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children, unquote. Now, this is now no more relevant than ever as we witness children disproportionately suffering from discrimination, exclusion, inequality. The plight of children is worsened by the prolonged effects of poverty, all forms of violence and conflict. Mr. Chairman, sadly, as most of us present today would know, my country, Sri Lanka, experienced the phenomenon of child soldiers at the hands of a group of non-state actors. This group used intimidation and terror tactics to pressurize families of the Tamil community in Sri Lanka to give their sons and daughters for their military purposes. When families refused, the children were abducted from schools or taken forcibly from their homes. Parents who resisted such recruitment faced violence detention, and even death. We are all too aware of what happens to children in the hands of such groups. As such, following the neutralization of this group in 2009, the government of Sri Lanka had a substantial task in relation to rehabilitation and reconciliation. One of the first priorities, I would say, of the government was to look after these children who had been forced to adorn the cyanide capsule around their necks to rehabilitate them, reunite them with their families, restore normalcy in their lives and help them become productive and proud citizens. All of these child soldiers, 594 of them were rehabilitated and reunited with their families special attention was given to those whose education had been disrupted due to conscription and who were desiring to complete their formal education. As a result, a number of former child soldiers participated in the national examinations. 11 children took up to the university entrance examinations and three went on to gain university admission to a universities and university education. Many others underwent vocational training and are now in meaningful employment. I'm just going to show you a little photograph of you will see of a child soldier holding up the cyanide capsule. There we are. 
Here is another soldier with one of her handlers who are now actually living in the United Kingdom without any sanction whatsoever. Here is another picture of the child soldiers in, in the back of a tractor. Now, these are things that we don't want to see at all hereafter. It is well recognized that involvements in violent conflict and loss of loved ones cause trauma and other psychological effects that affect the child's growth and education. These children, Mr. Chairman, were provided with professional counseling. Those that were disabled, injured, and required medical intervention were well looked after. National identity cards were provided to them, giving them a sense of belongingness. So as a matter of policy, no child soldier was prosecuted with priority being accorded to their investigations and speedy disposal of their cases. This was done with the assistance of the United Nations agencies, the ICRC and civil society organizations. Sri Lanka had a success story to share with the world. Unfortunately, this is now a forgotten story. It is deeply regrettable that certain sectors of the international community and even certain entities of the United Nations refuse to acknowledge such success stories. We continue to be hounded for defeating terrorism. They continue to be misled by the misinformation being spread by the remnant elements of this group of non-state actors that had brought such <laughs> misery to their own con community and um, no, uh, that, that the, the They continue to remain hostage to the political benefits accrued with such double standards. If we are serious about sustainably dealing with the issues arising out of conflict, then I say, including that of children, we need to remove the wool over our eyes. We need to work on common ground and face the reality if we are to make any real progress for humanity. Mr. Chair, Sri Lanka will continue to look after our own children and ensure that everyone will have a success story to tell. And I wish these other children suffering in the rest of the world would someday be emancipated from the misery that we are causing and would be free to live as members of a happy human family. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you, Your Excellency, for, for a really eloquent and persuasive statement. And um, we have three more speakers. Uh, next speaker in my list is the representative of the Dominican Republic. Your Excellency, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we would like to thank the Russian Federation, Kazakhstan, and the Office of the Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflicts for convening this meeting today. I will also like to thank the briefers for their contributions to this dialogue on such a pressing issue. We need humanity, empathy, understanding, and support to children forced to live in a world of conflict and violence. However, the conditions in which thousands of children are currently living in detention and in camps is alarming. Addressing their situation should be at the center of this council attention and priorities. Some of these children have suffered assaults or injuries, and most have experienced severe psychological distress and trauma. Without access to medical assistance, psychosocial support, or education, they continue to be exposed to suffering and risk of abuse with no clear perspective or reassurance for their future. The situation at the Abol and Raj detention camps are regretful evidence of how precarious the living conditions of children could be. Amid the COVID-19 pandemic, it becomes even more urgent for national governments to legally and safely 
repatriate foreign children. The state should not forget the responsibility under international law, including the Convention on the Right of Children, to repatriate the children and take steps to prevent them from becoming stateless. In this line, any decision that affects children, the best interest of the child shall always be a primary consideration and they must be treated first and foremost as victims, regardless of whether they are, their parents have been associated with armed groups. This being said, repatriation should be done as a family unit, identifying and caring for unaccompanied and separated children and supporting families tracing reunification and family contact. The legal vacuum in which children living in camps have found themselves into is worrisome and delays in repatriation may impact the treatment of these children before the law. With a number of countries that have repatriated hundreds of children from countries such as Iraq and Syria, we have learned that when there is political will, there is a way in many persisting barriers for repatriation purposes can be overcome. We thank Ambassador Ilazov for his presentation. We can look at the cases of Kazakhstan as promising models for addressing major security, humanitarian and health concerns through a holistic and integrated approach of repatriation. The fate of these foreign families can't continue hanging in the balance of as governments battle over their respective responsibilities. However, at the same time, we, mu we must ensure these children are effectively served by providing them all the humanitarian protection and assistance they deserve. The whole of the UN approach coordinated by the global framework must be used as the plan to deliver support to member states for the return of their nationals in order to guarantee that these returns are human-based rights, gender sensitive and age appropriate. We again urge countries of origin to increase efforts to identify the most appropriate routes for the repatriation in line of the best interest of the child. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your statement. And uh, now I give the floor to the representative, to the deputy permanent representative of Turkey. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, dear Gennady. Uh, our thanks to permanent missions of uh, Russian Federation and Kazakhstan for this important uh, meeting. Also, our um, sincere thanks to USG Warunkov and USG Gamba for their briefings. We also commend Kazakhstan for their for their exemplary actions uh, in, this, in this area. Uh, Turkey supports UN's efforts in taking the children and armed conflict agenda forward and commends uh, all efforts made to ensure that everything is being done to provide children with better prospects for their future. Unfortunately, we continue to see children immensely suffer in many places around the world as we have seen uh, throughout this uh, ARIO Formula meeting. COVID-19 pandemic, of course, causes serious impacts on countries in armed conflict, with children being among the most vulnerable groups. Meeting the fundamental humanitarian needs of children in conflicts and emergencies, including for the provision of health and education services, must be one of our main priorities. Turkey, on its part, takes all necessary measures to alleviate the suffering of children fleeing armed conflict. For the Syrian children who are under temporary protection in Turkey, we have succeeded to constantly increase the school enrollment rate. More than 750,000 of over 1 million school-aged Syrian children in Turkey, they are enrolled in education. I would also like to note that health services are provided free of charge for all Syrians, including children in Turkey. As for the children living in northwest of Syria, Turkey plays a vital role as the only corridor for the delivery of UN's cross-border humanitarian aid, where more than 4 million people live, 8% of whom are women and children. Continuation of the UN cross-border assistance mechanism, which provides uninterrupted and unhindered humanitarian access, is crucial for children living in this region, 
and we urge all council members to work in this direction in the months to come. While Turkey does its utmost to provide protection and humanitarian assistance for nearly 9 million Syrians, both within its borders and its doorstep in the northwest of Syria, we are aware of the importance of creating opportunities for children in Syria to avoid the risk of a lost generation that would undermine Syria's chances of recovery for years to come. We believe successful reintegration of children into society is not only a matter of protection of children's human rights, but also is of primary concern for achieving sustainable peace and development. In this vein, Turkey has joined the Friends of Reintegration and contributed to its celebrations. Assisting unaccompanied and separated children by providing shelter and protection and enrolling them back to school are only the first steps of reintegration. Comprehensive successful reintegration programs require long-term commitment and should follow a rights-based approach. Without psychosocial support and trauma treatment, children usually suffer in adjusting to society and coping with social challenges. Mr. Chair, governments have the full responsibility to bring children in conflict situations and their parents home where they can receive adequate care. According to UN figures, so far around 20 countries have repatriated more than 650 children. The actions of these countries, however, remain the exception rather than the norm, and governments should ensure the safe reintegration of children into their local communities and a safe, dignified, and voluntary repatriation of foreign children back to countries of origin. As co-chair of the Friends of Mediation and members of Friends of Reintegration, we strongly believe that protection of children as the most vulnerable victims of conflict should be mainstreamed also into mediation activities in a systematic manner. Giving due consideration to child protection issues and best interest of the child in mediation efforts should contribute greatly to achieving sustainable outcomes in peace processes. As underlined in the practical guidance for mediators to protect children in situation of armed conflict, conscripting children into armed groups constitutes a war crime. There must be accountability for all grave violations against children. Mediators should work closely with existing accountability and investigation mechanisms. However, Efforts for preventing recruitment and use of children by non-state armed groups should not result in conferring unwarranted legitimacy to terrorist organizations. It should be borne in mind that signing action plans and deeds of commitments are easily exploited by these groups, including for propaganda purposes. And we have seen several examples of this in recent past. Instead, priority should be given to reinforcing the international legal framework for the prevention of recruitment of children. Mr. Chair, the plight of children at the hands of terrorist organizations should continue to be our focus. In Syria and Iraq, PKK and its Syrian offshoot YPG have long been employing the tactic of recruiting young girls and boys forcefully and in violation of international law and norms, just like other terrorist organizations such as Daesh, Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra and other affiliated groups. We should unequivocally condemn crimes committed by all these terrorist groups, regardless of their ideological orientation. The Secretary General's 2020 report provides damning insights into the horrific treatment of children at the hands of PKK, as well as in areas under its control. As highlighted in this report, as no different than in previous years, YPG recruited the highest number of children in, in Syria. YPG also topped the list of the abduction of children deprivation of liberty of children and using schools and medical facilities for military purposes. Despite all this evidence of war crimes, it is regretful that this terrorist entity hiding behind the name of Syrian Democratic Forces is considered a legitimate counterpart by several among us today. It is high time that we have a united front against all terrorist groups and refrain from actions that legitimize them in full respect of the territorial integrity of Syria. We must particularly focus on the deteriorating situation in the al Hol camp under the control of YPG. Again, the so-called SDF, where 40,000 children from more than 60 countries continue to suffer in lamentable conditions. Security incidents and reports of deaths of hundreds of children continue to be recorded in this camp. Family reunification and repatriation remain crucial 
for long-term solutions to this protracted problem. We expect all concerned countries to assume their responsibilities and readmit their citizens without delay. This tragedy is happening in front of our very eyes and looking the other way is not a dignified approach to deal with this issue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, Thank you. Thank you, Bilge, for a statement. Uh, now, uh, the last speaker in my list is Your Excellency, Permanent Representative for Malta, uh, Vanessa Fraser. You give us all, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I begin by thanking the Russian Federation and Kazakhstan for organizing the Saria Formula meeting on children and armed conflict, as well as today's briefers, including the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict, Ms. Virginia Gamba, and then the Secretary General for Counterterrorism, Mr. Vladimir Voronkov. I also would like to thank Ms. Gamba for her continued leadership. For Malta, as, as co-chair of the Group of Friends on Reintegration of Child Soldiers, Children in Armed Conflict continues to require our attention. During these times, when the COVID-19 pandemic has rendered complex situations even more difficult, while the need to ensure human health and security is even more relevant, the topic remains of great concern. Children in situations of armed conflict are subjected to appalling violations and abuses of their human rights and violations of humanitarian law. They should not bear the brunt of conflicts as victims and be used as instruments of war. Therefore, as we step up global efforts to leave no one behind and to combat exploitation of the vulnerable, children need to be granted our due attention, especially in conflict zones. Children, including orphans and unaccompanied minors, are our shared responsibility. They should not be left to suffer consequences of leaders who are meant to protect them. Child protection provisions are fundamental to mediation efforts. Children need to be granted protection at all times, from pre-repatriation to reintegration. We need to ensure that their basic needs of access to food and water, shelter and medical attention are always met. Safe access to humanitarian relief should also continue to be prioritized to make sure that the most vulnerable are reached as soon as possible. Exposure to conflict and violence in childhood or adolescence gravely disrupts the development of children and their communities. Reintegration is also an area where more work is needed. Life does not simply go back to normal for children returning to their countries of origin. Too often, they are left to pick up the pieces and rebuild their lives at a very tender age. We need to ensure that children receive normalization and re-socialization by providing them with the support they need, including psychological support in moving on with their lives, at times without social network. We also need to ensure that societies truly enable children to reintegrate, offering a helping hand rather than turning away. The reintegration of former child soldiers is a long process, which needs extensive support from the international community. In this regard, UNICEF's work in this area must be acknowledged. Education central to preventing recruitment and use and to reintegration efforts, lack of knowledge as to how to deal with situations of, of children in armed conflict, how best to protect them and ensure their safety and well-being is what may prevent action in this, in this field. Repatriation and reintegration of children from conflict zones is not a matter that can be tackled easily. It is a concern that requires our common attention. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, this ends our discussion for today's meeting. Allow me to, on behalf of uh, the Russian Federation, to thank all co-organizers, briefers and participants we really discuss very important topic, very important uh, problems, and I hope we will come to certain conclusion. As usual, we'll try to summarize our discussion and to distribute among participants about general membership of the United Nations. Thank you for all uh, for, for, for your contribution, and uh, the meeting is adjourned.